as smooth as possible, and then, of course, issue the vital payments to farm businesses across Scotland as soon as possible thereafter. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 12763 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on post-study work visas. I'll give a few moments for the front bench to get themselves settled. Can I invite members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak button now? And can I also advise members um, that we have a bit of time in hand and I will, as will the other presiding officers, uh, allow additional time for interventions. So I call on Alistair Allen to speak to move the motion in the name of Hamza Yousaf. Uh, Dr Allen, 14 minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm uh, delighted to open this important debate today on the role that uh, post-study work immigration routes can play for Scotland. A post-study work visa would, of course, allow recent international graduates from Scottish institutions to stay in Scotland and to contribute to our economy and society. That's why the Scottish Government has consistently argued for the reinstatement of the post-study work route for international students. That's why we opposed its abolition by the UK Government in 2012. That's why we have continued to seek opportunities to press for its reintroduction, including in our submission to the Smith Committee last year. <coughs> there is no doubt in my mind that a post-study work visa would be in Scotland's interests. It would be in the interests of our businesses, of our world-class further and higher education institutions, and of the wider interests of the people of Scotland. We know that a post-study work visa is what our businesses and education leaders want, because that is what they are telling us. Our debate today follows the publication at the weekend of the post-study work working group's report. Now, the working group comprised business, student, further and higher education leaders. These leaders came together due to a shared concern across their sectors about Scotland's ability to attract the brightest and the best international students and graduates. In their report, the group confirmed their unanimous support for the principle of a scheme to enable international students uh, to, uh, graduate, who are graduating from a Scottish institution to stay and work in Scotland. Now, this report is important because it clearly sets out the case for the reintroduction of a post-study work visa in Scotland. Not from the point of view of the Scottish Government, but from the point of view of education and business leaders who are dealing with the aftermath of its abolition every day. The opportunities and benefits of introducing a post-study work visa were acknowledged in the Smith report. The Scottish Government is strongly committed to responding positively to the opportunity presented by exploring all possible avenues regarding the reintroduction of a post-study work route in Scotland. And so I am disappointed that the UK Government has not made as yet any substantive progress in taking this recommendation forward, despite continued efforts by the Scottish Government to press for action. Whilst the UK Government delays on this matter, presiding officer, I believe Scotland suffers. And yet, Scotland is a highly attractive destination for international students, and it is crucial that it remains that way. Our higher education system is underpinned by world-class research via a tremendous breadth of learning, including internationalisation and a focus on enhancing all aspects of graduate employability. Scottish education is known across the globe for its excellence, and as I never tire of pointing out, we have four institutions in the top 200 times higher education world university rankings. The 2014 research assessment framework found that 77% of research in our universities was world leading or internationally excellent, ahead of the UK average. And we know that the students who come here feel very positively about their experience. The most recent student academic experience survey in 2014 found that out of the four home nations, Scotland had the highest level of respondents, 88%, declaring themselves as satisfied with the overall quality of their course. Now, add to all of that, Scotland's natural beauty, friendly cities, world-renowned festivals, good travel infrastructure, 
And it's clear that this is a wonderful place to study, to work, to live, and unquestionably a highly attractive destination, therefore, for international students. I am very proud that Scotland has one of the highest proportions of international students in the world. In 2013-14, there were 28,610 international students at all levels in our universities from over 180 countries. This represents a small increase of just 1% on the total for the previous year. But these figures, but behind these figures, the negative impact of the UK government's immigration policy is being seen and felt. Scottish institutions are experiencing serious declines in the number of students from key overseas markets, with countries which have traditionally sent high numbers of students to Scotland now looking at alternative, uh, more welcoming, at least at an official level, more welcoming destinations. In March 2011, the UK government announced the closure of the post-study work visa route from April 2012. In the years since then, the number of new entrants to Scottish higher education institutions from India has decreased by 63%, and from Nigeria, the number has fallen by 29%. These figures demonstrate the real threat to the success of our universities presented by the UK government's present immigration policies. But there is another threat too. I will. Liam McCarthy. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking the intervention. I, I agree with much of what he says, including the, the regrettable uh, nature of the, the withdrawal of the post-study uh, work visa. Uh, he's given the figures for um, inbound students from India and Pakistan, and, and, and clearly they are a matter of record. Uh, but can he confirm that the overall number of international students come to the Scotland over the, uh, the last three years has actually increased and that there is a danger in ministers talking about a reduction in international students feeds the very problem that he is rightly pointing out. Minister. Well, uh, as the member will have just heard me say, I acknowledge that uh, overall there has been a very small uh, increase of around 1% uh, on total for the previous year. And I'm very happy to acknowledge that there has been that increase. But the member will ac acknowledge that that is something of a plateau and that if there are some of our biggest markets uh, who have traditionally supplied us with our, some of our largest numbers of uh, overseas students uh, uh, clearly expressing these concerns, and these concerns are, are worth uh, being mentioned in this place. I mentioned there is another threat, and while the, the numbers of international students uh, in Scotland's uh, higher education institutions are an issue for us and for the sector, uh, the number being attracted to our key competitor countries uh, is growing and worth mentioning because between 2011-12 and 12-13, international student numbers in three other uh, key uh, English-speaking university markets increased with uh, a modest growth uh, of 0.4% in Australia, 7% growth in the United States and 11% in Canada. Now, what do those trends mean? Well, I strongly believe that the crucial difference between Scotland and our competitors is the ability to set out an immigration policy which supports and enhances the higher education sector and the wider economy. We need to be able to compete on an equal footing with these countries, and to do that, we need to have a post-study work offer to match. In January of this year, uh, Alistair Sim, the Director of Universities Scotland, spoke on behalf of the sector when he said, Scottish universities need action from government to improve its post-study work offer. We are losing out in key markets as our competitors take steps to attract more international talent. And businesses too share his concern that without a post-study work route, we are missing an opportunity to grow Scotland's economy. In an open letter to the Smith Commission last November, Nine of Scotland's key education, business and employer organisations voiced support for the partial devolution of immigration powers to Scotland, specifically to enable the introduction of a post-study work entitlement in Scotland. Commenting at the time, Ross Martin of the SCDI said, greater powers to attract and retain high talent from other countries would make a big difference to the key economic tests for Scotland. Developing a more highly skilled and productive workforce creating more innovative businesses and improving our global skills and connections to grow our exports. Major Scottish industries would soon benefit from this talent. The Scottish economy and society have distinct long-term needs and there is broad civic support for this move. 
and that is why we are jointly asking the Smith Commission to transfer these powers and enhance Scotland's ability to prosper. And this government shares those views. I am certain that the UK government's immigration policies are damaging to the university sector, to Scotland and to our international reputation. Uh, I must make some progress. Uh, and to Scotland's uh, uh, international reputation. Scotland benefits immeasurably from the social, cultural and intellectual impact uh, of the more than 28,000 international students that study in our 19 higher education institutions. Uh, well, uh, in the interest of fairness, I'd better go for the, the person who offered first. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, if I can just remind you, as Mike Russell constantly reminded uh, the rest of us, that uh, higher education is also taught in further education. And although the international students have dropped by 23% in further education between 2010 and 14, EU and European students have fallen by 80% in the same period. So why, given that we have the common travel area, are we losing 80% of EU students compared to the 23% fall in international? Minister, well, you will be uh, rewarded at the end for the time that you spent. I will be rewarded sevenfold, I'm sure. Uh, well, I think it's fair to say um, that uh, some of the language that has been used by the UK government uh, around, around, uh, around, around people from uh, uh, many different nationalities, including, it must be said, uh, from Europe it has hardly been conducive uh, to them feeling uh, that they have an entirely warm reception here. Order, please. But the, the Richard Forrett report uh, by the University of Scotland in September 2013 uh, identified a number of key qualitative benefits uh, of internationalisation in higher education, which uh, include the enrichment of the learning experience, uh, the development of an international outlook amongst home students and graduates, uh, positive impacts in the, the wider community and the creation of a network of alumni around the world who can act as informal ambassadors for Scotland. It is our concern that the, the current Westminster approach to immigration is working against our demographic and economic need for migrants in Scotland. The Westminster approach to immigration is driven, I am afraid, by a desire to reduce net migration to the UK regardless of who those migrants are and regardless of the contribution that they make. The Westminster approach is driven by and focused on the needs and context of the southeast of England. Their approach takes virtually no allowance of the value of migration to the whole of the UK, to Scotland or to the social, cultural uh, and economic uh, intellectual contribution that migrants are making to our communities every day. The beauty of the post-study work visa is that it does not just help us to retain world-class talent to fill vacancies. We know that the prospect of a post-study work visa attracts international students to our, inter to our education institutions in the first place. Scotland was a trailblazer in the UK by introducing uh, the fresh talent visa to encourage young, talented and hard-working international students to stay here. John Swinney and the SNP gave that initiative an unresolved welcome when it was announced in February 2004. Scotland's success became a model for the rest of the UK, who went on to introduce the post-study work visa, which was then abolished by the current UK government due to, I am afraid, their obsession with reducing any kind of migration. It is nonsense, presiding officer, to drive away well-qualified and motivated young people from Scotland when they are exactly the kind of people that we need to stay and contribute to our great nation? The answer is simple. We need to bring back the post-study work visa in Scotland. And so, presiding officer, I would conclude by highlighting the damage that the abolition of the post-study work visa has uh, done to Scotland and to our future. Scotland welcomes the contribution new Scots can make to our economy and society. Scotland is open for academic and research business and we have the ability to provide a home for talented individuals who wish to build their lives and careers here. And the first step in that is attracting the brightest and the best from around the world to our colleges and universities. And the post-study work visa will help us do just that. On this, the Scottish Government is just not on the same page as the UK Government. We deplore irresponsible negative rhetoric on immigration. The Scottish Government supports a managed migration system that meets our needs. 
and that controlled immigration system for Scotland includes the reintroduction of a post-study work visa demanded by our education and business leaders. Thank you. Now calling Claire Baker to speak to and to move Amendment 12763.1. Ten minutes or so, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to open today's debate for Scottish Labour this afternoon. I'm sure we'll find much agreement across the Chamber. Um, I would like to very much welcome the report published at the weekend and thank all those who took part in the research and production of the report. The analysis and the argument is well made and this afternoon gives us the opportunity to endorse its work. Um, Scotland is a small place and I worked in and around the Parliament in the early days of devolution and I remember the launch of Fresh Talent by Jack McConnell as First Minister. It was an early example of this Parliament taking a different decision within a devolved settlement. It took negotiation with the UK Government to agree the policy but a strong case was made and accepted. It was a Scottish solution to a Scottish problem. It provided flexibility for immigration policy, but within a cohesive UK policy which retained the integrity of a UK system. Since the creation of this Parliament, Scotland has and does continue to face challenges with an ageing population, with skills shortages and with maintaining public services. Alongside a desire to articulate who we are, what kind of country we want to be and what we value. Fresh Talent was a scheme introduced to respond to these questions. If we have bright, educated, ambitious people come to our country to study and take advantage of our excellent educational institutions to contribute to our economy and our society, could we not have a system that gains some further benefit from the situation? The flexible, attractive, workable Fresh Talent Scheme was a new approach and it's one that was adopted throughout the UK until it was revoked in 2012. There appears to be two reasons for this. One was part of a way of dealing with bogus colleges. A number of bogus colleges were bringing people into the country who had no intention of studying for a degree or a qualification. Um, none of these colleges were identified in Scotland. Bogus colleges are unacceptable and exploitative, and it's right that action is taken to deal with them, but that action must be proportionate. Making it less attractive to actually come and study here is not the correct response. The other was the consequence of targets to reduce immigration. The removal of post-study work visas was a simple way of contributing to this target, but it's a decision which ignores the beneficial aspects of immigration to our economy and our society. Um, the impact of this decision is clearly laid out in the post-study working group report published in the last few days. Um, since the removal of the visa, we have at best seen stagnant international student numbers, but when the figures are looked at more closely, as the Minister highlighted, we see a disproportional impact reduction in students from Nigeria and India, with China a target growth area for many of our universities starting to see an impact. Um, these countries are all growth areas for international students. Our competitor countries, America, Canada, Australia, they are all seeing increases and all of them offer attractive post-study work options. And it's not just Scotland who is falling behind. Um, earlier this year, the UK All-Party Parliamentary Group on Migration published their inquiry into post-study work opportunities in the UK. They identify the same recruitment problems at UK institutions. They also highlight that under the current system, small businesses are particularly affected as they find it more difficult to get a sponsor licence and also to pay the Home Office's entrance salary. They also find the majority of sponsor licences are in the southeast of England, with other regions, along with Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, being badly affected by the lack of uptake from SMEs. Um, they also found that even by their own measure, the UK Government had overstretched their policy. As part of a target to reduce immigration, the UK Government's own estimate that its policy would reduce those securing visas by 49% significantly underestimated the impact of the policy, with the real reduction being closer to 88%. That is why in our amendment today we have called for the immediate removal of international students from net migration targets. It is a flawed policy which is counterproductive. So there are voices across the UK who are questioning the sense of this restrictive and damaging policy. But by holding the debate today and by the Scottish Government with the support of the Parliament arguing the case with current UK ministers, Scotland can be in the position of leading this agenda again. Because we all know that while they are here, international students make a considerable contribution to our economy, both in regards to the fees that they bring into our universities and their substantial off-campus expenditure that significantly benefits the Scottish economy. 
but we should give them the opportunity to become more involved in our economy, to help to grow it, to contribute through taxation. And I was struck by the numbers outlined in the report who want to set up their own businesses, be enterprising and entrepreneurial. Uh, but we know the contribution international students make is not just something that can be measured in pounds and pence. They contribute to a rich, diverse and multicultural educational sector and country. And we benefit from their choice to come to Scotland. International students contribute to our economy and our society. And those who wish to stay and work positively contributing to our economy once they have gained their qualifications should be afforded the opportunity to do so. And there's a lot of self-interest in this for Scotland. We have significant demographic challenges. We have an ageing population and a birth rate that doesn't keep pace. Um, as the report says, Scotland's proportion of the population of working age is also untypically low and is forecast to fall by 4% during the period 2012 and 2037, whilst the number of people aged over 65 years is projected to rise by 59%. We are facing the sharpest demographic challenge of anywhere else across the UK, and if we are to prosper as a country, we need healthy population growth. We are also facing acute skill shortages at graduate level in key sectors. Scotland has a higher level of skill shortages than the rest of the UK. And in 2013, 25% of all vacancies in Scotland are due to skill shortages. The report highlights that a wide range of skills were identified by employers as needing skilled graduates. Science, oil and gas, research, engineering, as well as business, media and public sector professionals. If Scotland is to be a modern, growing, competitive country, we must address the crisis and skill shortages. Of course, key to this is the skilling and investing in our young people coming through our own school system and having a programme of lifelong learning opportunities. But part of the answer is retaining the talent of international students to make their contribution. Uh, there's also an interesting discussion in the report of the value of students and graduates having a good experience in Scotland, which they then take home with them, creating a strong network of alumni around the world who retain connections with Scotland, good for our society and our economy. Um, I was interested in a comment in the College Scotland's briefing that the Minister may wish to comment on in closing, and it reflects, I think, on Mary Scanlon's comments on EU students. Um, the colleges say that traditionally they have been able to recruit internationally, but the priorities have changed with the move to reform and regionalisation, and they have had to consider carefully what international activity is now part of their delivery plan. Colleges are delivering some of the key courses that address our skills shortages, and the Minister in closing can maybe comment on what role the Scottish Government sees for colleges in international recruitment and how they can be supported. So how do we move on from today? Um, the report raises some debates around sponsorship, eligible qualifications and length of time, but these are all technicalities. There is strong support for the principle. We will have agreement, I imagine, today at decision time that reintroducing a post-study work visa is the right thing to do. Uh, the Smith Commission considered the policy and, as it was previously successfully introduced in Scotland, saw no barrier which couldn't be overcome within the current constitutional settlement to deliver the policy. They recommended flexibility and cooperation between the UK and the Scottish Government. And last week in the Chamber, the Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, said that meetings were ongoing. Um, and following today's debate, um, this debate and the publication of the report can strengthen the Scottish Government's position. One stumbling block is the continuation of international students in the net migration target, and I hope others will support our calls and our amendment for that to be resolved. This would make for easier negotiations. Um, presiding officer, in 2005, fresh talent was new and innovative and helped promote Scotland as an educational and entrepreneurial powerhouse throughout the world. Since then, other countries have upped their offer, and due to the current UK Government's decision to end post-work study visas, we are again faced with the challenges we faced 10 years ago. Uh, the current post-study visa regime in the UK is cumbersome and restrictive, particularly in comparison to nations that we would consider our competitors in the field of education. While they are taking advantage of some of the best and brightest minds the world has to offer, we are facing a competitive disadvantage. Um, Jack McConnell, in a speech last week, highlighted that our visa system is damaging our relations around the world and, in terms of this debate, is damaging the impression of this country in the eyes of young people across the world. The language about immigration that is used is making us look insular and negative. 
Today's debate gives us the opportunity to talk about the benefits of immigration. Yes, to recognise we need a fair and clear system of controlled immigration, but it also brings advantages to our economy, our universities, our colleges and our communities. The benefits of international students bring to Scotland are clear, and I hope the consensus today around post-work study visas can stretch to sorry post study work visas can stretch to consensus around the benefits immigration students bring and the need that we have an immigration strategy in place that is beneficial to the country as a whole and its constituent parts. Um, I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Liz Smith. Seven minutes or so, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, could you say at the outset that we will be supporting the government's uh, motion? I don't think anybody in this uh, chamber could fail to be uh, aware of the invaluable social, economic and cultural contribution that international students mm -hmm. and staff uh, make to uh, UK universities and colleges. And like others, we believe it's very important to celebrate the fact uh, that the UK remains the most popular study destination for foreign students after the United States. Scottish universities are quite simply second to none when it comes to their international reputation. And that's something that has been now proven over many years, given the very consistently high rankings in a wide variety of league tables. That success, I believe, uh, is precious, and it means that we should be very concerned when we hear a chorus of calls for change uh, when it comes to the post-work visa situation. Because notwithstanding the past and the current ability of the sector to attract international students and staff in what is becoming a fiercely competitive global market, something is wrong, quite far wrong, I think, when University Scotland, Universities UK, as well as the NUS and the wider business community are all expressing deep-seated concerns about some aspects of Westminster immigration policy, which they argue, quite rightly, in my opinion, that they are overly restrictive and they are threatening to diminish the good work of these institutions. Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope this chamber knows that the Scottish Conservatives made plain our support for many of these concerns to both Theresa May and to David Willits on separate occasions in 2012. These concerns are now, we believe, laid bare in the recent All-Parliamentary Group on Migrations report, which concludes that the UK is at risk of undermining its foothold in the international student market. And that is something that I say we need to be very concerned about. In Scotland, for instance, the 1.1% uh, increase in the enrolments of international uh, students in 2013-14 actually followed a 0.7% decline in 2012-13, uh, which was the first annual decline since records began. Furthermore, in every year since 2010-11, the Scottish, uh, uh, sorry, Scotland has experienced sharp double-figure declines in the enrolments of students from key overseas markets, such as India and Pakistan, I think. Uh, the Minister mentioned uh, Nigeria too. Well, I think Liam MacArthur's point is very valid that we have to keep it in the context uh, of what is the overall uh, perspective, but that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't drill down on some of the concerns about uh, the detail. And of course, when set against the comparable figures from our key competitors, such as the United States and Canada, the severity of that current pattern, I think, begins to emerge. So it is a real concern, and uh, we take that very seriously. And I think uh, the evidence is particularly troubling. In fact, uh, our Westminster colleague, uh, Richard Bacon, MP, found a common cause, I believe, with many when he said that the coalition government's current stance is, and I quote, uh, jeopardising Britain's position in the global race for talent. Nobody could argue that that isn't detrimental. So I have no doubt at all that our universities uh, are absolutely right to be concerned about the current situation, in particular the issues raised about the lack of uh, a timescale flexibility in the award of visas, and I think the lack of transparency when it comes to visa refusals, particularly for uh, PhD research staff contracts running beyond 18 months, uh, these concerns are perfectly justified. I heard these concerns very forcefully articulated a couple of years ago at the Aberdeen uh, University Medical School, and they have been raised twice at the, at the meeting of the uh, Parliament's cross-party group on colleges and universities. But my concerns uh, do not just end there, because this is a debate about the respect in which our tertiary education sector is held. And it would be unacceptable if restrictions rendered our educational establishments less able to compete internationally. And can I just flag up the theme of international uh, changes at the moment? I think uh, UCAS, just uh, three weeks ago, uh, made a very interesting uh, change 
in that uh, our students will not only be allowed to uh, apply for British universities, but also for uh, EU ones. And I think that's beginning uh, to show the changes uh, on the international stage. And nothing is more important, in fact, nothing I believe is probably uh, the greatest credit to the Scottish university sector than the way that they have developed uh, knowledge exchange, thanks, I think, partly to the uh, underpinning of the research that the minister mentioned uh, when he spoke. That knowledge exchange is so international these days so anything we do to undermine that is obviously uh, a concern. And so I think it is absolutely right that University of Scotland, along with the all-party parliamentary group on migration and the NUS, they make a very strong case for extending the length of time that international graduates uh, will be here for uh, high-skilled work. So I think uh, there is cross-party agreement in the chamber. Uh, but why are we here in the first place? Well, I think the reason is partly uh, the context of this debate. The coalition government... Uh, did have to take some action in the first instance because the number of bogus students abusing further in higher education uh, was at an unacceptable level. That was true in small measure in Scotland, but it was specifically true south of the border. And given the statistics that we had uh, at that time about bogus places, there was a very understandable concern if that didn't go unchecked, uh, then too many of our institutions would fall foul of good practice. Uh, when pursuing academic excellence and too high a proportion of international graduates would be moving into the low-skilled work uh, when the demand uh, was, and actually I think it remains, uh, for higher-skilled graduates. Previous government policy wasn't working. And so it was quite right that there were some reforms put in place to ensure things that were better. So I don't think the debate uh, is about whether these reforms are necessary. I believe they are. It's much more about the nature of them. And can I add here that I fully understand where Labour is coming from in requesting the government uh, immediately removes uh, all students uh, from the net migration totals. But in seeking to change that, I think there are some technical uh, issues that have to be uh, looked at first. So I think the Scottish Conservatives would prefer first to see how the post-Smith deliberations actually take place before we can make a wholehearted uh, commitment to what would actually be a very significant change to immigration data. I do understand the point you're making, but I think uh, we have to be careful about uh, how we go about it. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, just last Thursday in this chamber, in a debate that was uh, sponsored by Jean Urquhart, who I think is in the chamber, uh, we had a very measured and thoughtful debate which touched on immigration policy and much more importantly about how we handle that debate. I think the same sensitivity needs to apply to this de debate too. We must deploy a rhetoric with extreme care, making it abundantly clear that we welcome wholeheartedly international students intending to share their skills and talents and we welcome them because they bring such significant economic, social and cultural benefits to the country. But for me, immigration policy and the wider issue needs to be balanced. It needs to be wholly welcoming to these students, but it should also be punitive towards those who merely wish to take advantage of it for their own ends. And there are some students, a few of them, who are in that position. The question is how we address the very strong, the very persuasive and the very well articulated concerns of bodies like University of Scotland, but at the same time prevent any future abuse of the situation which was clearly causing issues in the past. So it will be to Scotland's detriment if we cannot sort this and the Smith Commission provides us with that opportunity. Many thanks. I now turn to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes or so. Christian Allard to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. And I welcome uh, Liz Smith's uh, contribution. I think it was very important to demonstrate in this Parliament this afternoon that uh, the Parliament is united uh, to claim that uh, what the Westminster government did in 2012, wa 2012 was wrong because there's no hiding the fact that, once again, uh, Westminster immigration policies are not working for Scotland. The abolition of the post study work visa in 2012 is a further proof of that. Last week, I participated to two debates in this chamber related to Westminster's attitude to young people wanting to live and work here in Scotland. We debated Scotland's place in Europe on Tuesday, and we celebrated Scotland's diverse communities on Wednesday. This is what this Parliament does, we, and does it well. We give the tone on immigration, a tone that our Scottish media are adopting when talking on the subject. A couple of years ago, the Sunday Herald was eager to celebrate the fact that a French-born MSP had taken his oath in French. So eager was Robbie Dean Whitty to tell the good news that he told his readers a fib, presenting officer. Robbie told his readers that I was educated at Dijon University. Let me be clear, and let's clear up any misunderstanding, presenting officer. I wasn't. The only time I went to the University of Dijon was when I went out with a student from Sweden. In reflection, I might have 
uh, never attended a lecture at any university, but obviously students were very much part of my youth. I also shared a flat with an American student from Chicago. I remember Amy, Amy Jo Tobin quite well. She told me never to use the F word. I wonder if Amy Jo ever set a foot in Glasgow. What am I getting at, presenting officer, is that inviting foreign students to study here does not only help but understand them, help them understand our world, but more importantly, invite, uh, inviting overseas students to live here help us understand the world we live in. Just like pollinating insects, foreign students as a bees playing a critical role in helping our uh, culture to flourish, our businesses to grow. Uh, Scottish students uh, studying abroad have the same cross-pollination effect, spreading Scottish seeds across the world. In 2013, 2014, there were more than 48,000 students from outside the UK studying in Scotland. This represents more than 21% of the student body and brings people from approximately 195 countries to live and study in Scotland. This is why the UK government's immigration policies are wrong for Scotland and damaging our economy. Business leaders in Scotland said so. In the post-study work working group report, 85% of businesses said that they were in favour of bringing back the post-study work visa for international students. What are we waiting for? In the same report, 100% of education providers in Scotland agree with business leaders. Let's bring back uh, the post-study work visa for international students. What are we waiting for, President Officer? 70% of respondents said that when a post-study work visa comes, comes to an end, individuals should have the ability to move into a longer-term visa. What's not to like? The tone adopted by political parties at Westminster is beyond belief. They tell us that migrants are draining our education system, overseas students are paying to study here. They are net contributors to our universities and colleges. They could be our future teachers and professors if, they allowed, if we allowed them to stay here. Westminster tells us that overseas students are draining our NHS. Presenting officer, we are the future nurses, surgeons, consultants and GPs that we are desperately looking for. It's a no-brainer. The question shouldn't be, should we make it easier for overseas students living here to stay and work? But the question should be, how best can we encourage overseas students to come and study in Scotland? The answer is clear. Uh, tell them uh, when they consider uh, Scotland as a place to study uh, that they will be encouraged to stay and live here. Uh, and it was in the Smith Commission, uh, Commission if, you, if you go the additional issues for consideration, the Smith Commission said that the parties should uh, explore the possibility of introducing formal schemes to allow international higher education students graduating from Scottish further and higher education institution to remain in Scotland and contribute to economic activity for a defined period of time. And what are we waiting for is my question, presenting officer. Uh, in uh, the submission from uh, um, a brief from Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, uh, the, uh, the strong and sustainable 2015 general election a plan for the North East is a manifesto which says exactly this, presiding officer. It is easy for me uh, to claim that the best of a generation are likely to want and travel the world, and we are the most likely to set up and live abroad. I'm one of those migrants uh, who set up in Scotland. It's not for me to say if I'm making a positive contribution to Scotland's economy and society, but for, for my members uh, to, to judge. And vast members who didn't have that opportunity, who didn't take that opportunity to study abroad. Some of you may, may, might have and, and decided to come back here into Scotland, but it's very important. And as, uh, I would like to make the point again of cross-pollinization. It's so important that we've got that engagement with the rest of the world and we keep that vibrant. Uh, the data published recently by Scotland chief statistician show that we are typically, us, migrant, younger than the Scottish population as a whole. Uh, we migrants are just as likely to be economically active as the rest of Scotland. And half of us uh, aged 16 and above in Scotland are qualified to at least degree level. I'm not one of them, presenting officer, I'm on the other half, but I would like very much to support the government motion tonight to, re to reintroduce the post-study work visa. And again, I will celebrate that this parliament is uh, all uh, in sync about this uh, particular issue. Presenting officer. Many thanks. I call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you.
presiding officer, and I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to speak in today's debate and to be supporting my colleague Claire Baker's amendment. The higher education institutions in Scotland are something that we all, and quite rightly, should be priding ourselves on. Scottish Labour has a proud history in creating a modern, inclusive, multicultural Scotland that attracts and welcomes international students to our world-leading universities. The Fresh Talent Initiative in Scotland was introduced by the then First Minister Jack McConnell in 2005 and the Scottish Labour-led Scottish Executive to encourage foreign nationals to study in Scotland. The Fresh Talent Initiative took a step forward when the UK government laid regulations which allowed students to apply to stay and work in Scotland for two years after the end of their course without the need for a work permit. Our connection with Fresh Talent Initiative is a very clear signal that we in the Labour Party want Scotland to grow in profile and in stature. International students already make up a large percentage of Scottish higher education institutions. There are currently over 30,000 international students from more than 150 countries in Scotland. However, the truth is that the number of Scottish students in Scottish University is de declining. In the future, assuming this trend continues, it will become necessary for higher education institutions to admit larger numbers of non-Scottish students in order to maintain their students' population size. Students from the EU countries have been essential in the growth of the Scottish University in the years past. And as the need for international students grow, the students coming from throughout the European Union will prove to be even more essential to the universities in Scotland. The suggestion of reintroducing the post-study work visa that was abolished by the UK government in 2012 has special implications for Europe as well. The students that are coming to study and potentially work in Scotland from the European Union are massively important to the skills they give back to Scotland after they complete their degree. By enabling and encouraging overseas students to work in Scotland after they complete their studies, it fills the objective of supplying the confident graduates which the employers who recruit the students need. Immigration, especially in terms of young people and students, is a good thing for Scotland. The benefits to our culture, our economy and our skills and productivity are vital to the continued growth of this country. Too often, immigration is placed in a negative light, but it is essential to recognise the importance that it has. Post-study work visas would not just benefit the education sector, but also to the business sector as well. The graduates that would be able to continue to live and work in Scotland would give back to the economy and would also contribute invaluable skills to the workforce throughout the country. NUS Scotland conducted a study, a survey about the reintroduction of post-study work visas and their findings speak for themselves. 100% of education institutions were in favour of bringing back post-study work visas. Initially, 85% of businesses were in favour as well. But in polling businesses that had hired an international graduate, that number rose to 94% in support. These numbers are irrefutable and in providing how important international students are to Scotland, Scotland is a great country with loads to offer However, we do need to make studying in Scotland even more attractive than it already is. By allowing these students, or those students, sorry, who have decided to graduate with a degree from a Scottish university, to remain and stay to work in Scotland as well, students would be much more inclined to make that commitment. Encouraging more international students to come to Scotland is imperative to meet the needs of our education and business sectors. In conclusion, presiding officer, we in the Labour Party believe that international students have a significant contribution to make 
to Scotland's education system, along with our social and cultural life and our economy. Therefore, university students should be removed from the net migration targets immediately, as my colleague Claire Baker mentioned earlier. Our universities are amongst the best in the world, and we need to ensure that they can continue to attract the brightest and the best students and researchers from overseas. Therefore, we are also committed to reintroducing the Fresh Talent Initiative in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. I remind members if they do wish to take interventions, I do have time for that. Chick Brodie to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> As I scan the policy horizon, it's hard to see a bigger risk or a more poisonous gun pointed at our collective success. Not my words, these are the words of Peter Downs, University of Scotland convener at the Higher Education Conference in December 2013. And it was hardly prescience that I asked a question on this very subject uh, last week. I raised it not just because of, of personal such circumstances that have been raised with me by Indigenous Scots uh, students who have developed friendships with, with those from abroad, but also because of a discussion that we had in the Economy Committee when we discussed the impending shortage of locally trained and foreign uh, software designers and engineers, thus threatening the global presence, the premier presence of our key video games industry. Just one example. So I welcome the debate today. You know, Scotland uh, is a nation that has always welcomed migrants from all over the world, uh, enriching our nation with many cultures and intellect, but also adding value to our nation through learning, through skills, through hard work, through leadership, and through business skills. Now, recently, the Westminster Cross-Party Group on Post-Study Work Opportunities uh, recently published its report on post-study visas. Frankly, the report's findings were damning of the current arrangements. A Labour MP, Paul Blomfield, who's the chair of the uh, all-party parliamentary group on migration and chair of the inquiry committee, said, and I quote, the report lays bare the negative impact that the 2012 closure of the former post-study work visa has had on British businesses and universities. And so is it for Scotland. Alternative visa routes have failed to attract talent and have actually prevented skilled inbound graduates from contributing, contributing to our jobs market. There is, I believe, strong cross-party agreement, not just in this place, on the need to take action to restore a reputation, a reputation as the destination of choice for international students from all countries. Uh, as Liz Smith said, uh, the Conservative MP Richard Bacon, also a member of the uh, APPG on Migration uh, Inquiry Committee, said higher education is one of our country's leading export success stories, increasing our soft power and helping shape the world of the future. But the UK government's current approach to uh, a post-study work and student migration policy is jeopardizing not just theirs, but our position in the global race for talent. We are already losing out to countries with a, a more sensible approach, such as uh, Australia, uh, Canada, and the United States. Such a short-sighted stance is damaging to the economy and hinders the delivery of our long-term economic plan. So we need to amend. We need to amend that policy and improve our ability to attract students uh, from around the world. Scotland has had, as I said, a worldwide reputation for providing opportunities and high quality education uh, to overseas students who then went on to contribute to the wealth of Scotland. Some estimated that value at one stage to be worth almost £1 billion to the Scottish economy. In 2012-13, Scotland welcomed 45,000 overseas students, every, uh, contributing £374 million to the Scottish economy uh, through uh, higher education uh, in institutions. Uh, no, and these were non-EU fees alone, non-EU fees alone, which shows the growth that we're seeing from China and Far Asian uh, students. Now, since the UK government announced the post-study work visa route 
uh, it would close in 2012. We've seen declines, as has been mentioned, in India, Pakistan, and Nigeria. In the Scotland's Future paper, set out, we set out the Scottish Government's vision in an independent Scotland for controlled immigration systems. Uh, and we welcome, of course, the, uh, post, the, the work of the post-study work group. Scotland has always recognised the value of attracting overseas talent. And as has been mentioned, the Fresh Talent Initiative uh, introduced by, by Jack McConnell uh, was a, immense, an immense uh, improvement and it had an immense impact on our economy. So what's vital now is that the UK government is true to its word in the Smith Commission in regard to introducing uh, visa schemes to allow international higher education students graduating from Scottish further and higher education institutions to remain in Scotland and contribute to economic activity for at least uh, two years. Scotland needs to become the destination of choice yet again for overseas students and have, uh, allow us thereby to have full control not just over our immigration policy but also how uh, students move from university uh, through tier, from tier four to tier two to gaining work in Scotland. Overseas students bring great benefits to Scotland. With our ageing population, as has been mentioned, we need to encourage migration into Scotland from skilled people from all over the world. We've always been admired for our global outreach and its impact uh, over the world. But it's not just us, as I've mentioned. According to MPs in Westminster, the current system is failing and failing them badly also. Immigration policy, including post-work study visas, should never, never be dictated by the outrages of a group like UKIP. So the working group on post-study visas is very important. Scotland needs powers over these visas as soon as possible to ensure we attract the most talented students to our shores and so that we ensure once again we continue as a growing and welcoming environment for the most talented in the world. The message then to foreign students should be, must be, that to be part of a globally competitive Scotland. Come to Scotland. We are open for your education. We are open for your business. Come to Scotland. Thank you. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Kenny McCaskill. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I uh, add my welcome uh, to this debate and confirm right at the outset uh, my wholehearted support for the reintroduction of the post-study work visa in Scotland. As Claire Baker's amendment makes clear, this was first introduced in 2005 by the Lib Dem Labour Executive under the Fresh Talent Initiative. And I, spay, I pay special tribute uh, to the work done by the former First Minister Jack McConnell in driving this forward, recognising the specific demographic and skills challenges we faced and continue to face here in Scotland. I note the Labour amendment goes on to call for an immediate removal of university students from the net migration targets. And I certainly support such a move for the reasons regularly cited by my colleague Vince Cable. But it is not clear if Labour is demanding this prior to the election or as a statement of uh, intent post May the 7th. If it's the latter, then fine. If it's the former, it smacks a little of a demand uh, asking to be disappointed. But I, I, I appreciate the, the spirit in which um, it is intended. Meanwhile, uh, Hamza Youssef's motion, if not always Dr Allen's speech, is generally measured and appears to recognise the existence and the value of the robust cross-party cross consensus that exists on the case for reintroducing post-study work visas here in Scotland. Again, what I'm not clear about is what is meant by the Minister's call for, quote, an immigration system for Scotland that meets its needs. As I've said before, the argument for a totally separate immigration system north and south of the border is riddled with holes and consequences that Dr Allen conspicuously failed to acknowledge. If the Minister's argument is for a post-study work visa system, a removal of university students from any overall target, and a discourse around uh, immigration at a UK level that is less inflammatory, I am absolutely in agreement. He should, though, be wary of conflating overall immigration policy and his party's commitment, as Chip Brodie alluded to, to increasing Scotland's population by a million or so, and a more modest, targeted, but nonetheless important measure, such as the post-study work visa. We will all have our differences, many of them have been articulated already in this debate, about why a case for change still needs to be made at this stage. But I believe we risk diluting the effectiveness of that case by overplaying the politics and undermining the genuine consensus that, ex that exists here, and as I think members have acknowledged amongst many MP colleagues as well. 
Dr Allen also downplayed, I think, for example, the need uh, there was to address the issues of abuse in relation to bogus students and institutions. However, this problem was very real. Ignoring it would have risked longer-term damage to our HE and FE sectors, as well as potentially adding to tensions in wider society. I certainly will. Minister. I'm happy to acknowledge uh, the, the problem which uh, uh, bogus colleges, as they were uh, called, uh, did create. Although, as a, I think other members have pointed out, uh, to be fair, this was not a problem that was prevalent so much in Scotland. Uh, I am while willing to acknowledge that. Will, will the member uh, uh, likewise uh, acknowledge that this in no way provides uh, an obvious explanation or excuse um, for the, the policy which is currently being taken around uh, post uh, uh, study visas by the UK <coughs> government. Liam MacArthur. Well, I think it, it sets a context, and, and the Minister is right to um, reiterate what I think others have acknowledged, in that the, the, the problem was one predominantly south of the border. But, but similarly, I think the risk to reputation um, flowed both ways, and I think dealing with it was in the interest not just of colleges and institutions south of the border, but those north of the border as well. There were problems in Glasgow, as the Minister will uh, recall, for example. At the same time, we are right to acknowledge and highlight legitimate concerns about the ongoing problems created by the current visa regime, both practically and in terms of perception and reputation. Right to in seeking a workable solution sooner rather than later. The opportunity to mould such a solution, of course, has been presented by the Smith Commission. The basis for that solution, I think, is to be found in the recommendations developed by the Working Group of Business, Education Student Representatives, to whom we owe a debt of gratitude. Details may need to be fine-tuned, but the group's proposals represent, I think, a reasonable aspiration and a basis for negotiation with any incoming UK administration. And why does this matter? I think the motion puts it very well, and others, I think, have all, all articulated that to some extent. Scotland can lay claim to genuinely world-class education institutions, competing effectively on the international stage for students and staff. In turn, this virtuous circle ensures that our culturally diverse campuses enrich Scotland's intellectual, social and cultural life. In crude financial terms, Universities Scotland estimate that international students contribute around £800 million in fees and wider expenditure within Scotland. But as importantly, the cultural and social infusion to our universities undoubtedly broadens, deepens and enriches the learning experience for our own Scots domicile students with all the benefits that it entails in the short, medium and longer term. So the rationale for reintroducing a post-study work visa in Scotland lies partly in enabling our universities and to a lesser extent colleges to maximise their chances of attracting students and staff in a highly competitive international market. But it also is about addressing the wider needs of our economy and society, capitalising on the desire of those who have benefited from our excellent education system and who may be inclined to stay a little longer, make a further contribution and even put down roots in due course. This, to me, seems self-evidently a good thing. Sadly, this is not a universally held view in Scotland. Consistently, social attitude surveys and even a recent BBC Scotland poll confirm that attitudes to immigration north and south of the border differ little. I know this runs counter to the narrative that the Scottish Government are keen to adopt, often to create the impression of otherness in respect to elsewhere in the UK. But the evidence for those assertions simply doesn't exist. Where there is, in a second, in a second, where there is a difference, I accept, is in the tone of the political discourse. Why this is, who knows? It may simply reflect the fact that immigration policy is reserved to Westminster and therefore MSPs and Scottish ministers do not face the same unrelenting pressure from the public, but particularly the media. It may be a question of the numbers involved. Whatever the reason, we need to continue to have the courage to conduct our debates in a more benign language, to make the positive case for why encouraging more, not fewer people from across the globe to see Scotland as somewhere they wish to come and not just study over the short term, but to live and to work over the longer term is in ours as well as their interests. At the same time, Scottish ministers and even those in the education sector must be careful about the language they use. In making the legitimate case for changes in UK policy over recent times, there's been uh, talk about a, quote, cap on international students and a suggestion that overall numbers coming to Scotland have reduced. Neither is true and both risk adding to the damaging impression that coming to Scotland or the UK is more hassle than it's worth. That's not to detract from the strength of the case for a change in policy. Uh, certainly, sorry. Minister. 
just two points, if I may. First of all, I, I agree with the member that I wouldn't overplay the differences in opinions that may exist. I've knocked enough doors to know that immigration is, a, is an issue uh, of concern on the doorstep. But if he breaks down and looks at the Oxford Migration Observatory's uh, analysis, for example, he'll note that most people in Scotland, and I think this will probably be reflected in the UK, actually believe that the numbers of international students shouldn't be reduced and there shouldn't be restrictions, unnecessary restrictions uh, uh, on those. And I hope that he would... Uh, uh, reflect on those. In terms of uh, his second point that he was just making, having travelled to India recently, I can tell you that every single journalist, every single organisation I met, every single person I met asked us why the UK was making it more difficult for them to come to work yeah. and to study. So perception sometimes, unfortunately, can be the reality. I wonder if the member uh, will reflect William on that. I think the Minister makes a fair point in relation to trying to dig beneath the, the figures. And what I, The point I was trying to make in terms of the Social Attitudes Survey and even the, the BBC Scotland poll is that it is wrong to simply assume that there is a, a more benign impression of, of immigration at large in Scotland than there is south of the border. But I think when you press people on, on what, uh, uh, what we're talking about here in terms of increasing overall student numbers, I suspect what you get is a very different um, uh, response. In relation to the impression uh, that's been created in key markets, he cites India, I suspect Pakistan is not widely different, Nigeria likewise. Those are key international uh, markets for our universities and I think the numbers we've seen there um, are, are, are a source of real concern, which is just one of the reasons that uh, I certainly support uh, a change, both in terms of the tone, but specifically in relation to the post-study work visa. So as I say, it's not to detract from that case uh, for change, uh, but a reminder that we all have a duty of care. We also need to look, as Mary Scanlon suggested, at wider issues as to why our colleges have seen such a, a fall-off in numbers of international students. A 75% drop in EU students has nothing to do with visa issues. And as Colleges Scotland and Claire, uh, Claire Baker suggested, they point to pressures caused by mergers and hint at the effect of bu budget cuts. This is regrettable given the financial and wider contribution international students have made to our colleges in the past and requires further consideration. Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, again, let me welcome this debate, reiterate the support of the Scottish Liberal Democrats for the reintroduction of a post-study work visa in Scotland that can only help enhance and enrich our universities and colleges, as well as our economy and society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think it's useful to start with three preliminary points. I think we welcome the general consensus that there has been. It's heartening in many ways. Equally, though, uh, without being too churlish, I think it's indicative, perhaps, of the fact that what's being sought is not, perhaps, earth-shattering here. It's certainly not a distinctive immigration policy. Uh, Post-work study visas are important and vital, and it's helpful, therefore, that we do have unanimity regarding their uh, benefit to Scotland around the Chamber. But the fact that we have that unanimity is perhaps indicative that it's not too hard to give for those who are of a difficult constitutional uh, perspective. I think also, secondly, it would be fair to say that whilst fresh talent was welcomed when it came along, there is a great deal of mythology about fresh talent. There was no huge significant change to the, fair, just to the last uh, Labour Liberal administration. It was well packaged, well presented. It did give opportunities for Scotland to sell itself. Uh, but when you drill down in actually what was available and what was granted, uh, there wasn't much available here that wasn't available elsewhere, but a good bit, as I say, of well-packaged pa and presentation uh, went on, uh, and it shouldn't be sniffed at, and therefore I do give credit to Jack McConnell and his colleagues then. And I think, thirdly, the point being made, by all means... Liam McCarthy. I thank Kenny, Kenny McCaskill for taking the point, and I, I have to say I don't necessarily disagree with them in terms of the, the mood music around fresh talent. Um, but would he accept that actually what it did was create an impetus elsewhere in the UK to follow suit so that Scottish universities wouldn't have a competitive advantage? Ken McCaskill? I think it was helpful in terms of giving Scotland a slight edge, but I don't think it was the changes that were sought by the universities north or south of the border, but I'm not seeking to be too churlish. Reference was made about the fraud and the uh, uh, criminality that was going on, and I think that reference was made by uh, Elizabeth Smith. I think the point here is not that people were abusing uh, the system in terms of coming in with fictitious uh, colleges. Uh, I felt a great deal of sympathy for many of these young people coming in, and I had experience of it in my own uh, constituency. This was criminal. What was going on was that young people were being exploited, them or their families, 
by people who were establishing so-called colleges of education that were not providing it at all. I have to say that within Nidre, in my own constituency, one of the most deprived parts of my constituency, I met young students hanging around someday who had come over from Nepal or elsewhere, uh, who were almost the victims of criminality, given who they were, strangers in a very difficult and challenging area. They were being charged top dollar, had come in thinking they were coming to some equivalent college along with the University of Edinburgh or whatever else, rather than blaming the young people. The fraud was that we were not dealing with these people who were exploiting them, making a great deal of money. Thankfully, many of these institutions were closed down, although I do think many prosecutions should perhaps have followed as well. But I think there's two important parts that have to be made, and these are the two aspects. One is the importance of post-work-study visas to our economy and to our society, and that's been referred to by many around the Chamber and, thankfully, from all uh, political uh, parties. But secondly, I think it's important to point out that it can be done. All it requires is the will from Westminster. I very much welcome the comments made by Elizabeth Smith and the Conservative Party, but it is incumbent upon Westminster to actually deliver and implement. We are not asking for an independent immigration policy here. We are asking for something that is important to our society and to our economy. And that leads me to the first of those parts, the importance to our society and to our economy. Universities are a vital part of the modern economy here in Scotland. Within the city of Edinburgh, as I last recall, I think universities, the combined universities, are the second largest employer in this city. I think that is the same position in Glasgow, in Dundee, in Aberdeen, and in many places. And that's even before we add in the colleges. But you just have to look at the number of staff employed by the universities of Edinburgh, Heriot Watt, Napier, Queen Margaret, all of whom add to the economy. They do bring in, as many people have said, I think it was Chick Brodie and others, the spin-off jobs, the high net worth individuals, the professors, the talents, all of that that creates employment, not simply from the employment that's there with their professors or their lecturers or whatever else. But there's an awful lot of jobs, many of whom my constituents uh, carry out, whether it's in catering, whether it's in cleaning, whether it's in maintenance, simply providing remunerative, reasonably well-paid jobs within this city and indeed every other city, the length and breadth of Scotland. So universities and education are vital to the Scottish economy, in addition to the benefits that they provide in educating our own people and charging young people from elsewhere top dollar. And the people that we're talking about here are paying top dollar. They're paying significant amounts of money. So we have to recognise the importance to the economy. The importance to our society is there as well. The reference that was made to the jobs that are spun off out of it, the high net worth, the intellectual capacity that we couldn't acquire in any other shape or form. It's because of Scotland punching well beyond its weight in terms of university education that we are being able to deliver. And yes, it will help to tackle, as uh, Claire Baker and others were saying, in terms of demographics. We're not at crisis point in Scotland, but we do have to address it. Circumstances are better now than they were when Jack McConnell first instigated this scheme. After all, we're now at 5.3 million. We do have an increasing population. Uh, we do need to do an awful lot more because of the demographics, because of the ageing population. But we are, I think, beginning to see some light at the end of the tunnel. But this is hugely beneficial for our society in those aspects as well as in the other areas that are brought in terms of the mixture, the cosmopolitan nature that they create. And that then comes on to that it can be done. We're not asking for the earth here. We're asking for something that will benefit the Scottish economy and the Scottish society, where we have a distinctive position from the problems faced with regard to immigration south of the border. We see it as a benefit here, not as a drain, as perhaps as a perspective down in the south of England. And that's why we need to have these powers. It is part of being as close to that federal society as we were promised in the referendum without giving us the powers of an independent nation and indeed powers over immigration. Other countries do it and have done it for some considerable period of time because I remember the criticisms I made of fresh talent not going far enough a decade ago. Let's look, for example, at the federated companies that are mentioned often by those who wish to retain the union, such as Canada or Australia. Let's look at South Australia, which has a distinctive immigration policy other than New South Wales and indeed uh, uh, Victoria. 
It has been recognised for a long time that Adelaide did not have the cachet that existed for Sydney and Melbourne. And when people were emigrating to Australia, it was those cities that they wanted to go to, not to Adelaide. And on that basis, South Australia was given the opportunity for people to go and migrate to South Australia at a lower points differential than you would require to get into elsewhere to other states and certainly into Sydney or in Melbourne. That has been granted and that is the same situation that applies in Quebec and in Canada. So what we are seeking is simply what is given in other jurisdictions where you recognise the benefit that the nation, the uh, part of it that is uh, losing out in whatever shape or form so it can be done. This would be good for the Scottish society. We require to compete Could in that global close, world. Please? And I'm just concluding, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, to take on board the points made by Liam MacArthur. This is about leadership. It can be done if Westminster is prepared to grant it. This idea that we need to beat ourselves up because there are individuals in Scotland who have wrong and false views of migration is something that I say I don't think we should be countenancing. Yes, we have individuals in Scotland who have views that are abhorrent. It comes down to political leadership. If we stand up and articulate, as Canada and Australia do, that close, immigration please. is a good thing, then that can be delivered and the people will follow it and welcome the political lead given. Thank you. I do have a little bit of time in hand for interventions. Matt Griffin to be followed by Jimmy Day. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute in this afternoon's important debate on post-30 work visas, um, a policy introduced by Labour and, in my mind, uh, unjustifiably cut by the Conservative Government. We've heard about the reasons around that and issues such as um, bogus colleges. I think that the, the response to, to remove the post-study work um, visa was much like using a, a sledgehammer to to crack a nut, and that I agree with a lot of what um, Kerry McCaskill had said, that the, the answer to bogus colleges was pursuing the, the criminality um, and pursuing the, the, the people who were exploiting um, innocent immigrants, rather than um, a wholesale withdrawal of the, the post-study work visa policy. Because there's, there's no question that that policy has had a positive impact, not only on those people who came to Scotland from overseas, but on Scotland's economy and our university and college sectors. You know, the post-study work visa enabled international graduates to seek employment without sponsorship for up to two years after the completion of their course. Um, certainly since the UK government closed the tier one route in 2012, there's been a detrimental impact on colleges, universities and businesses here in Scotland and right across the UK official figures show that there has been a decline in first year student enrolments from China, India and Nigeria. And colleagues tell me on the colleagues who are on the cross party group on China tell me that in every single meeting of the, the cross party group the issue of post study work visa is raised and the difficulty with Chinese students um, one of our key emerging mar markets in, in accessing Scottish institutions. Now, similarly, uh, across the UK, in the year that the post-study work visa was repealed, the intake of students from overseas declined for the first time in 29 years. I, I can remember when the previous Scottish Labour government introduced the Fresh Talent Initiative in 2005, uh, mostly because I was still at university, and in the, the years following, uh, could see the impact on, on that initiative. Yeah, but that did encourage foreign students to, to come to Scotland and then allowed them to give something back by working here and contributing to our economy for two years without uh, a work permit. That initiative was then adopted by the UK government in 2008 and again helped to increase the number of international students come to Scotland. Our colleges, and particularly our universities, rely on this significant financial support from overseas students who contribute around £337 million per year in fees and approximately around £450 million to the wider economy, investment that we can't afford to be without. And in addition, 
to the financial consequences of a fall in overseas students from key markets like India and Pakistan. The, the scrapping of the post-work study visa has had a, a reputational impact to the NUS. Um, I've commented on the hoops that international students are expected to go through and um, the hoops they continue to have to go through while they're here is, is unacceptable. The minister um, himself spoke about his, his trip to India and the, the real reputational risk that we have in Scotland and, and not looking like an open market for uh, the best talent in the world to, to come and study here and feel welcome and valued and contribute to our economy. Um, Mary, Senior, Mary Senior from UCU stated that um, there's a sense that the UK government's immigration policy is very narrow and insular and not to the benefit of Scotland or universities. Um, I think all of the parties in this parliament recognise the, the problems that have arisen as a result of the decision taken in 2012 to end the scheme. And it's important that future UK governments take the decision to reverse that regressive step. But it's also important, and there's clearly willingness um, from the, the Scottish Government to work with the, the UK Government to make sure um, that, that Scotland has that, that variation um, now to allow us to take a, a different approach and, and reintroduce um, that, that fresh talent initiative. Yep. Mary Scanlon. I, I just listening carefully to the member. Does he agree with the Smith Commission uh, proposal of uh, in, uh, exploring the possibility of introducing a formal scheme uh, to allow international higher education students in Scotland to stay on? Does he agree with Scottish Government and UK work, working together to achieve that? Mark Griffin. Yeah, that, that's what I was saying. I think I do agree. I do agree with the, the proposals of the, the Smith Commission. I come on. Um, to talk about that later, I just said that I think it's right that the Scottish and UK governments actually work together um, to find a, a solution to, to making sure that an initiative like Fresh Talent can happen again. It happened um, here first under Jack McConnell. McConnell, there's no reason to stop it um, happening again. I, it's been touched on earlier that... Um, the slowing down in the, the rate of growth of international students here in the UK isn't happening elsewhere. Our, our main competitors in the, the English-speaking world of uh, the United States, Canada and, uh, and Australia have continued to expand their student numbers over the course of the last five years. And Universities Scotland, the, the Minister has used the same quote in saying that we are losing out in those key markets as those international competitors have taken steps to attract that international talent that, that we are now missing out on. I'm pleased that um, Scottish Labour, we've been able to commit to reintroducing the, the Fresh Talent Initiative. As the Smith Commission highlighted, Scotland's a much more diverse, vibrant and culturally varied nation because of immigrants. The benefit to our educational establish, establishments, business and our economy as a whole by reintroducing such an initiative is clear. Um, it's therefore uh, of utmost importance then that the UK and, and Scottish governments get together um, to work to um, end those unjustifiable, unjustifiable restrictions that are currently in place. Thank you very much. And I now call Jimmy Day to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Following last May's debate in Parliament on immigration policy in relation to higher education, I'm pleased that the matter of the post-study work visa is again being debated, and I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to take part this afternoon. This is an opportunity to recognise the vital contribution that international students make to higher education, research excellence, the economy and cultural diversity of Scotland. In December last year, when the Smith Commission report was published, I took the opportunity to make clear my concern in Parliament to the Deputy First Minister about the failure to include in the heads of agreement of the Smith Commission the views of the National Union of Students Scotland, Universities Scotland, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the Institute of Directors Scotland, the Scottish Council for Development and Industry, and Unison Scotland, that there should be partial devolution of immigration to enable the reintroduction of the two-year post-study work visa for international students who graduate from our universities and colleges. 
The Deputy First Minister's response was that the Scottish Government would seek to engage constructively with the UK Government on this matter in order to make progress on reintroducing the post-study work visa. And to do that in order to ensure that Scotland can attract and retain talented students from across the world. As the MSP for Edinburgh Southern, I am incredibly privileged to represent not one but two of Edinburgh's world-class universities, the University of Edinburgh and Edinburgh Napier University, both of which have campuses in my constituency. Together, these two universities make up a large proportion of Scotland's 50,000 international students. Over 30% of Edinburgh Napier, Napier University's student population is international, and the 13,735 international students at the University of Edinburgh, which make up 40% of that university's student population, represent the largest international community at any Scottish university. And the University of Edinburgh has echoed many of the findings of the post-study work working group's report highlighting that universities require greater support in recruiting and retaining the world's best academic talent and that the removal of post-study work opportunities for international students puts Scottish universities on the back foot in competing in what is a highly competitive uh, global market as we currently are not able to offer students the opportunity to live and work long term in Scotland after graduating. The convener of University Scotland, Professor Pete Downs, makes this point well and I quote, as it stands, the UK's immigration policy is anti-competitive. It is a deterrent to highly skilled students and staff, and it is hurting our universities. Furthermore, we in this chamber can all agree that international students make a significant financial contribution to Scotland's economy. £374 million was accrued from the tuition fees of non-EU international students at Scottish higher education institutions in 2012-13, with a further £441 million through accommodation and living costs. This is a clear demonstration that international students support local businesses in the towns and cities in which they live, which in turn boosts Scottish jobs. Research for Universities UK has estimated that each international student enrolled at a university supports 0.45 full-time equivalent jobs in the UK. The University of Edinburgh has calculated that this supports over 6,000 jobs in the local area due to the university's global student community. Mary Scanlon. Wait, does he also agree that EU and European students contribute enormously to Scot Scotland's economy, culturally, etc., but they've been reduced by 75 and 81 per cent, whereas international students have been reduced by 23? Would he also share my concern for U EU and European students? I certainly um, would acknowledge the point that all students from whichever part, uh, part of the world they come from enrich uh, Scotland uh, in the way that the, the member has indicated. But I think and hope that she would acknowledge that we have a consensus through this working group uh, that the current system is not actually fit for purpose. Now, in terms of the findings of the, uh, the working group, uh, a number of points, I think, um, are very significant and need to be put on the record. One of these is that the UK government, um, since the, the um, changes to the post-study work uh, visa in March 2011, there has been a substantial decline in enrolments of international students at our universities. Uh, we've seen this for, uh, in terms of students from India and in terms of students uh, from Pakistan. And these are higher education statistics agency uh, figures. Key competitor countries who offer more attractive post-study work opportunities have, in contrast, seen a rise in their numbers of international students. For example, the United States has seen international student numbers rise um, by over 5% on average, and, and Canada by over 7% over the past five years. The current system is, as Liz uh, Smith stated, unduly restrictive, and as Mark Griffin has uh, referred to, uh, narrow and insular. And there are two findings in the report to Scottish ministers which underline those points. The first of these is the low number of graduates across the UK being allowed to stay in the UK under the Tier 1 provisions of the Home Office, uh, which relate to graduate entrepreneurs. Only 1,900 graduates a year who have been awarded a degree in the UK can extend their stay under this route in order to set up a business. The second point relates to the restriction which applies to the main route for graduates to take up employment in the UK, 
where employers who wish to employ a non-European economic area national must hold a UK Home Office sponsorship licence and must employ them on a minimum salary of £20,500. In 2013, only 4,000 Tier 4 students switched into Tier 2 after completing their studies, allowing um, uh, those studying for a PhD to spend one year in the UK on completion of their studies to undertake employment or self-employment. Now, the point about all of this is that the system does not meet the needs of our universities, our businesses or our wider economy, nor does it allow us to address the demographic challenge and the skill shortages which Claire Baker uh, referred to earlier. A number of members have referred to the Fresh Talent Initiative, and I think it is important that we acknowledge uh, the important work uh, that was done under the previous First Minister, uh, Jack McConnell. In conclusion, <laughs> Presiding Officer, it is clear that the reintroduction of the post-study work visa would help make Scotland's economy and society better off. Commenting on the UK's policy of curbing the entry of international students, Gordon Maloney, President of the National Union of Students Scotland, stated, for too long we have allowed a negative and damaging rhetoric to take precedent, precedence when we discuss immigration, harming Scotland's reputation abroad and depriving our communities from the benefits we know international students bring. This Parliament is united in its support for international students and I think it is high time that the UK Government worked with the Scottish Government to make that principle a reality. Many thanks. I now call Hans Alamalik to be followed by George Adam. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. It is a pleasure to talk about post-student work visas. I have historically been encouraging international students to visit Scotland, in particular Glasgow, for many years now. I would first like to state that it was the Scottish Labour Government, Jack McConnell, that first introduced post-study work visas to students. Now that is, there is a broad agreement among Scottish Parliament and education institutions that we should reintroduce the scheme once again, as we in Scotland quite clearly are not benefiting from the current system. Scotland generally benefits from the international students learning in Scotland. And as Jamie has said, in 2012 and 2013, the Scottish higher education institutions received 374 million pounds from international student fees. In addition, NUS Scotland estimates that while students are in Scotland, international students also contribute to the Scottish economy and in particular local economy and estimate that 441 millions were spent every year. And this is just only by students. This is not counting the relatives, friends, and others who come and visit them uh, in Scotland while they're studying and their subsequent visits thereafter. Whereas the number of international students has remained reasonably steady, there has been a major fall in students from uh, previously important countries such as Nigeria, India, and Pakistan, already mentioned by several speakers. Much of the fall has been compensated by students from China, but there is a risk in being so dependent on one market as the recent decline has shown could be very unhelpful to the industry overall. And I think it's a risk that we perhaps don't want to take. Another reason cited for not choosing UK institutions for higher education is the much better opportunities of work experience and possible migration offered by countries such as Canada, for example. The UK Employment Skills Survey report published in January 2014 noted that Scotland has a higher level of skill shortages than the rest of the UK. In 2013, 25% of all vacancies in Scotland were skill shortages. This figure was significantly higher than the 15% reported in 2011 and also higher than the levels reported for England at 22%, Wales 20%, and Northern Ireland at 18% in 2013. So, okay, we have post-study work visas. We'll encourage more international students to come to Scotland. I get that, but what I don't believe that is the automatic that there will be an end to skill shortages. Where I have spoken to businesses who have hired people through fresh talent initiatives, for two years, many have said that staff that have got fully trained and very productive then had to leave at the end of that period. The next difficult part 
is how do we manage the varied immigration systems throughout the UK. And an interesting example is the provisional nominee program in Canada. They've had an increase of 11%, and I wonder why. Well, let me tell you why. Because Canada has set aside resources to actually support and promote good relations between recent migrants and the wider society. I have not had any time to look at, at that particular scheme in much detail, but I'm happy to go to Canada to do some fact-finding with the European and External Relations Committee if that's a challenge I have to face. <laughs> now at this point, I, I'm, I can pretty much re, re, recycle my speech I gave last week on negative attitudes uh, on immigra immigrants. In my speech, I gave statistics to show that there was still widespread underrepresentation of ethnic minorities in education and employment. And, in Sco and the Scottish government did not give me any explanation, and just because I didn't get an explanation doesn't mean that I'm going to stop mentioning it. I'm going to keep mentioning it every opportunity I get because this is an important issue for us in Scotland. We cannot keep hiding. There is no point in saying that we want more immigrants to come to Scotland if you're not actually combating the race in our society today. I said public services are employing at 0.8%, apprenticeships 1.1% out of a population of 4% of the minority communities. That's unacceptable, and it doesn't give a very good picture. It's very nice to say that, you know, we're a great country and you must come here and very diverse but practically we're not delivering on the ground, and I think that's un unhelpful. I'm not going to go away. I'm going to keep banging at this drum to let people know that this is still an issue. And I made a, an offer last time, and I made an offer on my first year in this parliament that I'm here to help. I'm here to uh, uh, give my support to try and deal with this issue. No one's come to my door yet, but I'm still here, and I'm still willing to help out if, I ca if anybody needs my help. And last but not least, I think it's absolutely crucial that uh, the amendment is uh, considered seriously because I think it's absolutely important that we continue to encourage uh, overseas students to come to Scotland. I have always wished that we continue to in, uh, encourage our universities and colleges to continue to support our education system, and it's, it's quite crucial that we do so. The revenue that is in, uh, stimulated in our industry the fresh talent with young thinking uh, minds, fresh minds coming from overseas to encourage uh, competitive uh, thinking in Scotland, I think is, is crucial. It helps build uh, minds and uh, I, I think it, it encourages uh, unpaid uh, ambassadors around the world for Scotland as we did historically before. I think we should continue to work on that. I believe that we should continue to demand that the government takes our proposals very seriously because I think it's, it's absolutely important for an industry and the well-being of society today. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call on George Adam to be followed by Cara Hilton, a generous six minutes. Thank you, President Officer. I enjoy debates like this because it gives us the opportunity to really discuss an important issue like this uh, in a way that uh, we can up here, not in the partisan way that is done in other places. And I think it brings up some important issues that have already come up in this debate. We now know that Christian Allard attended university but did not study there. Uh, the rest of the story, presiding officer, was probably too much information. So, swiftly moving on, I think we can take from today's debate that uh, our international students make a valuable contribu uh, contribution to Scotland's economy and society. In fact, I would say that we must, as a nation, retain international students because they contribute so much to our communities. In Paisley, in the University of the West of Scotland, uh, they have recruited non-EU international students for some time, and they have made such a difference to our community. And the, f the challenge for us is to make sure that they stay within the community and they actually uh, do not move on later on. The other thing that was brought up by Mark Griffin was quite right about Chinese students, because in UWS, they have also recruited quite a lot of Chinese students there as well. And how we deal with that uh, is the way forward. We've seen the potential, and as my colleague Christian Allard has already said, what's not to like about it? You know, according to Higher Education Statistics Agency, 
Uh, Scottish higher education institutions receive an overall income of £374 million. And this has already been said by Chick Brodie from other non-EU international students. These figures uh, represent 12 per cent of the total income for Scottish higher education institutions. But off-campus expenditure uh, by international students amounts to some £12.2 million. Local businesses in Paisley have benefited from this over the years, but as a town, it's something that we still need to develop further. And it's something that we need to ensure that we get the advantage, and other communities in the country get an advantage of being a university town. So you can see why education and business leaders in Scotland have clearly set out a case for the reintroduction of post-study work visas in Scotland. The Westminster Government's policy on this issue is wrong and is uh, limiting our universities' potential and limits our economy. We in Scotland need to find a way to be able to retain these individuals. It is, of course, welcome that the Smith Commission's view was that UK and Scottish Government should work together to explore a potential post-study work scheme in Scotland. And we're all hopeful, and today's debate is quite uh, useful in that as well, that the Smith Commission can deliver on this, because we need to have that power to ensure that Scotland has the opportunity to uh, make the legislation we need to work for us. But the post-study work, working group uh, report confirms that it calls for the post-study to reinstate, obviously, as we've already said, and how the scheme would operate, and asking the UK and Scottish governments to work together. And it also uh, gives us recognises that post-study work visa is an important lever for attracting the best international students, ensuring that we uh, manage to get everyone over to our institutions here, and they see Scotland as a way forward for them, and ensure that they can actually live the rest of their lives here. One of the interesting points was that the survey was that Scottish business and education providers showed that 90 per cent of all the respondents were in favour of bringing back the post-study work visa for international students and 100 per cent of the education providers and 85 per cent of businesses. So that just shows you how important that is to all the people involved in this. And the Minister Hamza Yusuf has stated previously uh, one of his comments he said is the immigration policy is currently too heavily influenced by the priorities of the South East of England based on the values of the current UK Government and driven by a desire to reduce the numbers of incoming migrants, which does not recognise Scotland's needs, nor does it serve our economic or social interests. And I think that's the whole point of this debate, as we are saying we're trying to find a Scottish solution for this uh, situation. Now, even some of the universities themselves, Professor Pete Downs, convener of the University of Scotland, principal of University of Dundee, said the case to allow international students to work in Scotland was overwhelming and described the UK's current immigration policy as anti-competitive and a deterrent to highly skilled students and staff, and it's hurting our universities. Now, we currently are working in a position where our universities are internationally renowned and doing very well, but we need to take these quotes on board. And we also need to look at uh, what Alistair Sim, the Director of Universities Scotland, said. A strong presence of international students is an asset to Scotland's universities and Scotland as a whole, as well as making a significant economic contribution. So everyone has agreed that we need to move this forward. I know that uh, Claire Baker and Jim Eady have already mentioned about our competitors in the international market, but it has to be said the United States and Canada are good examples of countries offering post-study work visas for international students. Uh, there are also the number of international students, as already has been said in the USA, has increased by 5.5%, and the number in Canada by 73 So that shows you that if you've got the ability to do that, it can make a difference. Professor Anton Muscatelli, uh, Muscatelli pr principal of Glasgow University, says that the current UK policy is a message that says, don't come here. We're closed for business. We're closed for education. It's exactly the opposite message that a number of our other countries are sending, including the US, Canada, Australia. I don't think that's what we should be. Uh, I don't think that we should they be there as a country. And I think he's right. I think we have to say that we don't want to be here. This debate is a perfect example of how, as a country, Scotland, we don't want to be there. And it's representative, even though our colleague uh, Liam MacArthur was quite negative in uh, some of the things he said here today. That is not the reality of the situation. Scotland does 
uh, see itself as a country. We are a country that has always encouraged immigration. We have worked together with our people from other cultures and they have delivered and made our culture so much better as well. So I would say, presiding officer, in closing, that uh, we need to have these powers, we need to embrace this, and we need to make uh, ensure that we can uh, get, uh, make, make this difference. As my colleague uh, Christian Allard said, if we get these powers, what's not to like about that? Many thanks. And I now call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate on post-study work visas, in particular in support of Scottish Labour's amendment. Scottish Labour believes that international students make an invaluable contribution to our education system and to our economy, culturally, academically and financially. There are currently over 30,000 international students from more than 180 different countries studying in Scotland, bringing an estimated £373.6 million in fees to Scottish universities and £32.5 million to Scotland's colleges. International students also contribute significantly to Scotland's economy, helping support our public services and our local economies, valued at around £441 million every year. As has been mentioned already, it was Scottish Labour who first introduced the Fresh Talent Initiative back in 2005, encouraging students to work, study and stay in Scotland, and we extended this across the UK in 2008 aimed at ensuring that Scotland had a constant flow of fresh talent to flourish alongside our homegrown talent, enabling us to succeed and compete in the global economy and to make Scotland better and stronger and address the demographic challenges that we face head on. So did the decision by the coalition government three years ago to scrap post-study work visas was damaging right across the UK, but it was especially damaging here in Scotland. An aggressive move not only limiting opportunities for our international students, but posing a real threat to our higher and further education institutions. A move that seemed to be more motivated by politics and a desire to bring down immigration figures with our universities, our economy and international students paying the price. While overall student recruitment is up very slightly by 1%, Scotland has seen a 2% decline in enrolment from China, which colleagues have commented on already, a 12% drop from India and a 9% drop from Nigeria. And this reflects the direction of travel in UK immigration policies in recent years. In contrast, key competitors such as the US and Canada have continued to expand their international student numbers over the past five years, up 5.5% in the US and 7.3% for Canada. So it's time for a change and today's debate is a welcome one. I'm really pleased that there is cross-party support for action. Scotland and indeed the rest of the UK is a much more diverse, vibrant and culturally varied place because of immigration. And we should be recognising, celebrating and awarding the contribution that's been made to our society, to our economy and our education system. We should be rejecting the negative and nasty rhetoric from the likes of UKIP, which seems to blame immigrants for society's ills. Scottish Labour wants to see a modern, inclusive and multicultural Scotland which attracts and welcomes international students to our universities and to our colleges. We therefore welcome the recommendations of the Scottish Government's post-study work review group, which calls for the reintroduction of a post-study work group for international students, a move that's been backed by a broad coalition of university, college, business, trade union and student representatives, as well as right across the Chamber today, that recognises the specific demographic challenges that Scotland faces, which contrasts with the rest of the UK, and which would help tackle the skill shor shortages faced right across Scotland, which are responsible for an estimated 25 per cent of vacancies, according to a UK Employers' Skills Survey report. The briefing that we received from NUS Scotland for today's debate tells us that while England's population rose by 15 per cent between 1971 and 2012, Scotland's only rose by 1.5 per cent. That's 10 times less. The proportion of our population that's working age is low and on the decline, with the numbers over the age of 65 forecast to rise by 59 per cent over the next couple of decades, posing us significant challenges for the future. So we need to recognise that the contribution international students make doesn't end when a student graduates. Scotland has got to be a positive and welcoming destination for international students, and that offer must include the opportunity to stay on in Scotland and to allow their eligible families to join them too. For our universities to be world-leading, we need to attract students from overseas, and these students need to be made welcome. 
The, this doesn't just benefit international students, it enriches the experiences of Scottish learners too, and as College Scotland point out in their briefing for today's, today's debate, it's a cultural exchange that benefits everyone, allowing students to share different perspectives, values, experiences and beliefs, promoting Scotland too at international level. Across the rest of the UK, there's also a demand for change, as Claire Baker has highlighted. The recent report, report by the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Migration looked at the impact of ending post-study work visas and recommended reforms to allow students to remain in the UK for at least 12 months after graduation. They found that across the UK, removing the visa had resulted in a significantly larger decline in the number of skilled international graduates able to remain in the UK than the government had anticipated. And last year, the UNUS, the NUS at UK level, released a report in partnership with the Entrepreneurs Network, which surveyed 16,000 graduate students, um, sorry, 1,600. 42% of them said that they wanted to set up a business, but less than a quarter of them wanted to come and set, wanted to set one up in the UK due to the very restric the restrictions on visas. A staggering one third said they would not recommend the UK as a study destination to their friends and family. So this is another co coalition policy which is undermining our future prosperity. And across the UK, it's been estimated that the restrictions are costing British universities £2.4 billion over the next decade. So in conclusion, Scottish Labour is committed to reintroducing the Fresh Talent Initiative in Scotland. We want to ensure that the Scottish dimension is properly taken into account in de developing our immigration policy. Staff, students, college, colleges, universities, businesses are united in their call for action. We want a re we need a re re sorry, a bit tangled up there. We need to reintroduce a post-study work route for international students in Scotland as quickly as possible, and I hope we can work together to make this happen. The evidence base for such a move is crystal clear and beyond doubt. We should be celebrating international graduates who want to contribute to Scotland, not excluding them as a way of massaging immigration numbers or meeting targets. We need to have a model that meets Scotland's distinct demographic and economic needs and ensures that Scotland's an attractive place for uh, international talent from right across the world. That's got to include the right to work and stay here in Scotland. I hope we can see progress very soon on this vital issue for our colleges and for our universities and for Scotland and that we can take action to ensure that we attract the brightest and best students and graduates, that Scotland's door is fully open to people from right across the world. Many thanks. And I now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Jane Baxter. Generous six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by welcoming this debate and the publication of the Post-Study Working Group's report? There is, of course, broad consensus across the education and business sectors and indeed across large parts of this chamber that the current UK government's immigration policies are wrong for Scotland and are damaging our universities and our economy. During my time sitting on both the Education and the Economy Committees, I have heard the case made time and again by those with first-hand experience about the valuable contribution international students make to our economy and our society. And we all know that leaders in education and industry almost universally condemn the abolition of the post-study work visa as a hugely detrimental step. The UK government has systematically enacted measures to reduce immigration in recent years, but we need a different approach to attract skilled individuals to study in Scotland and to encourage them to stay and contribute to our society and help us meet the economic and demographic challenges of the future. Last year, the Education and Culture Committee held an inquiry into Scotland's future. One submission from the Scottish Chambers of Commerce pointed to Quebec and its distinctive immigration policy as a potential model for Scotland Quebec has its own immigration criteria separate from the rest of Canada and that has benefited Montreal as a magnet for talent in particular. As some other members have addressed the educational implications of the abolition of post-study work visas, I would like to speak briefly about the work that I am currently involved in as a member of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, which is conducting an inquiry into the importance of boosting Scottish exports. As University Scotland recently highlighted in their submission to the inquiry, our higher education sector is a major exporter and international students contribute over 800 million annually to that sector. 
The committee uh, yesterday afternoon um, were in Aberdeen. Uh, we were hosted by Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce and we heard submissions from Robert Gordon University which has conducted its own small poll looking at the impact of the removal of the post-study work visa and the impact on its enrolment figures for international students. The findings uh, were stark. The number of international students enrolled at the university declined by 9.5% between September 2011, when it was, when it was announced that the post-study work visas would be abolished, and September 2013. This was in spite of the fact that the number of international students being offered places over that time period had actually increased by 6%. RGU's study shows that the number of enrolled international students initially dipped when the Scottish Government's distinctive Fresh Start initiative was absorbed into the Westminster controlled post-study work visa and it declined noticeably after the announcement in March 2012 that work visas would be abolished. While our world leading university sector will undoubtedly attract many to come to Scotland to study, what many students want is peace of mind that upon finishing their studies they will be able to stay and apply the skills they have learned to, in Scotland. And we mustn't forget that this is a hugely competitive international market. The committee's advisor for our export inquiry is Jane Gotts of Glasgow Caledonian University. And yesterday she highlighted that many Scottish companies cite a shortage of the right skills, particularly language skills and knowledge of overseas mar uh, markets as a barrier to exporting. Encouraging post-study students to stay and contribute their talent after graduation is therefore an obvious way to support Scottish companies who wish to boost exports, which is, of course, a, a, a key goal for the Scottish Government. Another benefit of this approach would be the potential network of ambassadors that would spring up across the globe. Following the return to countries of origin, talented individuals with practical experience of working in Scotland will help to build a network that could help support more Scottish businesses in their international efforts. Ms Scotts has helpfully suggested that if post-study work visas are reintroduced, a matching service between businesses and higher or further education institutions would be welcomed by both industry and the education sector. This could be done potentially through Scottish Enterprise or a private sector organisation like SCDI or the Chamber of Commerce. Scottish Networks International was a good example of this industry and education collaboration. The potential for growth in start-up businesses for Scotland should also be taken into account as all overseas students will not necessarily want to work for a company. Many overseas students are entrepreneurial, so a route to giving them the opportunity to set up their own business in Scotland could also be good for the economy and could link to existing start-up hubs like Entrepreneurial Spark. Um, I mentioned earlier how competitive uh, the, the quest to, to attract international students is and other members have, have mentioned the fact that the United States attracts many international students. I have some knowledge of uh, the, um, uh, um, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where my daughter studied and it's very, very striking uh, the number of start-ups in uh, that area of, of Cambridge, Massachusetts. In fact, I think it's got the highest number of start-ups um, of anywhere in the world, and that is because of, uh, of, of the, uh, the talent coming out of MIT and Harvard, much of which comes from around the world. I hope that we will be successful in lobbying Westminster for the reintroduction of post-study work visas, particularly in light of the Smith Commission finding that Westminster should work with the Scottish Government to explore schemes to allow international graduates to remain in Scotland and contribute to our economic activity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I now call on Jane Baxter to be followed by Jane Urquhart. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is a hugely important topic for Scotland's universities and colleges. There are over 30,000 international students studying in Scotland from more than 150 countries. In total, 11% of all Scotland students come from elsewhere in the EU and a further 10% come from elsewhere in the world. That's one in five of the students at our universities coming from out with the United Kingdom. It's a tremendous reflection of the quality of our universities that they're able to attract such large numbers of international students and a huge boon to not just our economy, but to our culture as well. Speaking broadly about this issue, and, and as I have said before, 
I am disappointed that only universities are generally discussed when public debate turns to international students. Too often, people's attitudes towards Scotland's colleges are that they are of secondary importance to our universities. Governments in both Holyrood and Westminster have made choices that have resulted in drastically fewer foreign students attending our colleges, which has a financial and structural impact on them that is much greater than that on our elite universities. But to return to the issue of, of this afternoon's debate, I am concerned about the impact of the current Tory Lib Dem government's immigration policy. In particular, I am worried about the in including students within the blanket immigration cap. That policy treats all legal immigration in the same way as a bad thing for Britain that should be reduced, and that, in my view, is entirely wrong. The Labour Party across the UK strongly believes that it is deeply damaging to the UK's social fabric and economy that the number of fee-paying overseas students has fallen at a time when the international market for universities in other countries is growing. That is why university students should be removed entirely from the net migration target, which is, in any event, a policy that has failed. We do need to explore how we can encourage students to stay in Scotland once they graduate, not force them to leave. Scotland, in particular, faces an acute demographic challenge in the coming decades. There were around 820 centenarians in Scotland in 2010. That is projected by the National Records of Scotland to be over 7,500 in 2035. The number of people over 75 is projected to increase by over 80% in that same time frame. Our population will age at a faster rate than the rest of the UK. The Parliament's Finance Committee noted in 2013 that the proportion of Scotland's population, which is of pensionable age, is projected to increase by 2.9 percentage points between 2010 and 2035, compared with the 1.7 percentage point rise for the UK. This will be accompanied by a much smaller increase in birth rates. This means that our population will age and accompanying this change will be the myriad associated increases in spending. Immigration, particularly immigration of high-skilled young people, is therefore an important aspect of how we finance Scotland's public services in the future. Foreign students tend to be young and are, by definition, highly skilled. Those organisations who know most about the value of foreign students, University of Scotland, the University and College Union Scotland, the National Union of Students, Stud Students Scotland, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce and the Institute of Directors Scotland have made clear that they support the expansion of post-study visas. For example, the principal of the University of Dundee, Professor Pete Downes, has said that Scotland has distinct demographic, demographic challenges that adversely affect our potential for economic growth. We face skill shortages in key sectors as articulated by business, and our universities are forced to operate in an anti-competitive environment in attracting international talent that could be of great economic and social benefit to Scotland. Universities in Scotland have seen a 2% decline in first-year student enrolments from China, a 12% decline from India, and a 9% drop from Nigeria. These are key countries for international student recruitment, and it's a source of major worry that there has been such a marked fall in student enrolments from these nations. I know that such a pro programme can work in Scotland because such a system has already operated under devolution. In 2005, the Labour Party introduced the Fresh Talent Initiative, which allowed students to stay in Scotland for two years after they had graduated. This utilised the sort of cooperation between the UK and Scottish governments that is the hallmark of the best policy on this topic that we encounter. The Fresh Talent Scheme was continued until 2008. When it became such a success, it was rolled out across the entire UK. Sadly, however, it was withdrawn by the Tories and Lib Dems in 2012. This is a sort of myopic policy formation that puts the short-term political interests of the Conservative Party above the economic and social interests of the British people and economy. As the entrepreneur and inventor James Dyson said of the policy, it's a bit short-sighted, isn't it? A short-term vote winner that leads to long-term economic decline. When we have governments that are willing to engage with each other and cooperate, we can ensure as we emphasised in our Devolution Commission and was typified in the Smith Commission, the Smith Commission report agrees that all parties will explore the possibility of allowing international higher education students graduating from Scottish education institutions to remain in Scotland. Like much else in the report, this is sensible. Similarly, the Labour Party's five-point approach to immigration includes a commitment to a smart system which distinguishes between types of immigration so we bring benefits to our economy and tackle problems and fair rules so those who come to Britain contribute to our economy and society. 
A new approach to this issue is entirely consistent with these principles. We can also see in other countries, too, allowances being made for sub-state areas within them. For example, there are such systems in Australia and Canada. In our Devolution Commission report, we identified that there are some barriers to setting up such schemes, but that we ultimately believe that reasoned and agreed variations between Scotland and the rest of the UK are justifiable and workable. The Fresh Talent Scheme has shown us that the way forward is through cooperation. This is the model that we should follow. I hope Scotland's two parliaments and governments can work together to make sure that those who choose to come to Scotland to study can continue to contribute to our culture and economy once they have graduated. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I now call on Jean Urquhart to be followed by James Dornan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I mean, this is a very timely debate, I think, and it, it's heartening to hear that there's cross-party support for the reintroduction of post-study work visas. And we've heard from everyone on the, on the contribution made by, by such students, uh, be they cultural, social, economic or educational, but we cannot assume that in spite of the reputation of Scottish colleges and universities that these students will keep coming. We know that competition in the education sector is tough. Many of our colleges and universities are making greater and greater efforts to attract students from around the globe, even to the extent of name change. I mean, what was the RSAMD, the Royal Scottish Academy of Music and Drama, is now the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. A change uh, not made because people were demanding a change to the name, but a change made to attract students and for them to better understand uh, the work of the college and the potential the, that it had. So no matter being the best, no matter that our universities and colleges are uh, opening branches in many other countries around the globe, and it may be that the growing number of courses available will produce those who graduate with the University of Glasgow or of Edinburgh, or indeed of, uh, with, with a degree from Glasgow, uh, uh, Edinburgh, or indeed of the Highlands and Islands. So what will bring those students here? Presiding officer, not enough to be the best, not enough to provide good student association and welcome as these institutions know. They need all the support they can get in order to maintain or grow the international student community. The post-study work visa is only but one, but, but perhaps the most important one good reason to make application to one university versus another. In the Highlands and Islands University, some of the colleges, partner colleges, developed the potential for business experience to follow the course content as well as being part of the course. For example, textile students in Shetland can, were they allowed to stay postgraduate, uh, access some of the uh, equipment, large industrial knitting machine, for example, uh, to better develop a business, business skills and experience whether there is a market for their product or not. And manufacturing must be one of the most important uh, areas that we cover. So the opportunity of getting this kind of experience for a period after graduation is certainly an attractive option. And Scotland has a great deal to offer in this respect. We've seen in all of the, the um, papers that we've received from the National Un Union of Students or business organisations across Scotland that there is, it seems to me, cross-sector, uh, cross-party, support for the reintroduction uh, of these visas. Um, I'm not sure about this, the Smith Commission. I know that it's, that, it, that it's there, but it does occur to me, and particularly after listening to Lord Lang on the radio this morning, that the Smith Commission might not just be the quickest method by which we're going to uh, see these developments happen. And I think that it's incumbent on everybody in this chamber to show that there's a real urgency about this. I mean, fresh talent, uh, and it's been mentioned, has been referred to this afternoon, and all credit to Jack McConnell and the Labour Party. Uh, it's important to recognise that they brought it about. But it's also important to notice that, given the powers over immigration that Scotland needs and clearly deserves, fresh talent surely would still be in place, and we wouldn't need to be having 
this debate. I think it's disingenuous of Liam MacArthur to try and link somehow all of the evidence from academics, business and agencies who support the post-study work visas to su suggest that there's a danger that, quote, not everyone will agree. And by way of evidence, <coughs> cites the BBC Scotland's research that people in Scotland are not unlike people south of the border with reference to immigration. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'm very grateful to Jean Nierkirk for taking an intervention. I, I think the point I was trying to make is that the assumption that somehow that the population in Scotland takes a radically different approach to immigration than those south of the border is not borne out not just by the BBC survey but by uh, um, uh, attitude surveys over a number of years. That's not to say, and I think Kay McCaskill made a fair point about the leadership we need to show, uh, but I think it's worth acknowledging that we don't somehow uh, work with a, a, a more enlightened or progressive uh, population population at large. Uh, thanks very much for that. And in fact, I was just going to go on uh, and refer to exactly the point that Kenny McCaskill made, um, that it is up to us. But it ill behoves us, I think, to constantly hark back to, in some ways, a bigger, a bigger issue. And we had the debate on immigration last week, which I think uh, we're, we were all very much agreed about that. And these points were made and well made by members at that time. I think Joan McAlpin's point about MIT is a great example. Um, you know, where creativity is developed, it can flourish. And Scotland will need to have the control of immigration if we are to realise that to our full potential. Members, I believe that if we... We should, first of all, I would suggest that we must push uh, for this to be... To be considered out with the Smith Commission. I think it's a, a seriously important issue for Scotland and for our colleges. And more than that, I think it's seriously important for the kind of economic development that we really want to see. Why on earth, why on earth would we see that talent? And we've acknowledged how many thousands of students we're talking about uh, educated in Scotland and then insist that they leave this cannot be right, and I hope that we will uh, really push to have, to have this enforced in the House of Commons and uh, our case made out with the Smith Commission. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on James Dornan, after which we move to closing speeches. Six minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Throughout this debate on post-study work visas, one thing is clear. This chamber has a firm belief that international students and immigration more broadly is fundamentally good for Scotland. We want and indeed need international students who have studied in Scotland to stay and continue their lives here. To do that, we have to make it much easier for them to apply for visas that allow them to work and contribute properly to this society after they graduate rather than the restrictive way that it's done currently with the four-month time limit and restrictions thereafter on the visas that can be applied for. We need more people to settle here post-study because, as we know, Scotland has an ageing population which requires us to grow our working age population to support and strengthen our economy. But it's more about more than that. It's about putting in place a system that says we recognise that there is more than just the clear economic benefits to international students studying and stay in Scotland, that there are massive social and cultural benefits too. In 2013-14, there were more than 48,000 students from outside the UK studying in Scotland. That equates to 21% of the student population coming from almost 200 different countries that are here to study. The lifeblood of universities is the free exchange of scholars and students, and everyone benefits from hearing about different experiences, exchanging different ideas about how to do things, and broadening minds. These are all the bedrock in which our education system is built on. To put an artificial barrier to that in the form of punitive immigration policies that are based on political rhetoric rather than any sort of need is frankly absurd. It's absurd because it has a no it's having a knock-on effect on the number of international students who want to come to Scotland in the first place to study, share their experience and exchange their ideas. As principal of the University of Glasgow, Professor Anton Muscatelli has remarked about the removal of these visas. It's a message that says, don't come here, we are closed for business, closed for education. It's exactly the opposite message that a number of other countries are sending, including the US, Canada and Australia. I don't think we should be there as a country. He mentions Canada. Their government has been focusing on offering post-study work visas, which has seen their number of international students increase by 7.3% in 
In contrast, since the closure of the post-study work visa route, there has been a significant fall in the number of students coming to Scotland from countries which traditionally sent high numbers of students, including Nigeria and India, by 29% and 63% respectively over the last three years. NUS conducted a survey on international students. The survey found 90% of all respondents in favour of bringing back visas for international students. Business support for the reintroduction of PSW rose to 94% among those who had hired an international graduate under previous post-study work schemes. 70% of respondents said that when a post-study work comes to an end, individuals should have the ability to move on to a longer-term visa. And the majority of respondents across business and education providers believe international students should be free to remain and work in Scotland for at least two years after graduation. NUS also concluded that many international students feel unwelcome in the UK as a result of the UK's government's hostile and overzealous policies. And what is worse is that the UK's removal of these post-study work visas is because of politics rather than need. It has been seen as an easy way to reduce the number of immigrants to meet an artificially politically motivated quota that has no bearing on the realities of life across the UK and which, according to the Institute for Public Policy Research, has come at a high economic cost. And as Jane Baxter said earlier on, it isn't even working. We have a different way of looking at immigration in Scotland. As David McCollum from St Andrews University has said, the character of immigration in Scotland is distinctive in terms of both the nature of immigration flows and social attitudes to immigration. Scotland is dependent on migration for democratic stability and growth to a greater extent than the other constituent countries of the UK. So this policy is coming at a much too high a cost across the whole of the UK and has an even worse effect in Scotland. It was therefore good to see the Smith Commission recommend that the UK and Scottish governments work together to explore the potential for a post-worthy stu study visa programme in Scotland. It would have been better if it taken it to the next level and proposed that the powers necessary to introduce such a scheme were transferred to the Scottish Parliament, which would act in the best interests of the country by looking at the best way to attract and retain talent here in Scotland. And that is crucial because bringing back the post-study work visa into effect would allow us to attract students from all international backgrounds. Like many MSPs, I've taken on student interns from across the world who fall in love with the city, make lifelong friendships and have a connection to the Scottish Parliament. Some, like my current intern from Ireland, get the opportunity to stay because of the EU and we should always protect that right and recognise the contribution that they make to our economy and the diversity and vibrancy that they bring to our nation. It can't be right that others don't have the same opportunity. It's easy to see why international students are turned off from dedicating their time to a place only to have to leave when their course was over, when they could go somewhere else, be more warmly welcomed get comparable experiences and then get to settle their post-graduation if that's what they wanted to do. It's a dilemma that faces too many international students who we should be when we should be showcasing Scotland. It's a time that we had an immigration system in Scotland that meets our needs rather than the negative and harmful system that we have in place now. Bringing back post-study work visas would be a good place to start. Many thanks. Um, we now move to the closing speeches and I call on Mary Scanlon. Uh, eight minutes or thereby, please. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and, and may I just take this opportunity to commend uh, all speakers, in particular Liz Smith, who I think set out our uh, stance uh, to this debate in a very uh, thoughtful, considered and measured way, as we've all come to expect from Liz Smith. Um, I know it's been a little bit painful to have almost three hours of consensus this afternoon. Yeah. And... Uh, I appreciate it's perhaps not been as entertaining as usual for people in the gallery, um, but you know we 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 are we, we do share what's been said uh, in the tenor of this debate. Uh, there's no doubt, as others have said, that uh, international, EU, and European students. Uh, all benefit Scotland, and they're not just here for the money. Many have mentioned the money that they spend, and yes, of course, that's welcome. But it benefits Scotland in so many other ways, culturally, in terms of productivity, in terms of skills, uh, economically, academically, and in so many other ways. And they're not just here to, uh, uh, to learn from us. We, they're here so that we can learn from them. And, and I think that's an important point uh, that we, we should also say. Um, can I just uh, go back on immigration? I do remember when John Reid was Home Secretary, he described the Border Control Agency as not fit for purpose. Uh, and there was recognition that bogus visas for study and bogus colleges had to be addressed. 
But for an immigration uh, policy to function properly, it must welcome those who are willing to contribute to society while acting against those who seek to exploit the system for their own ends. I first of all just wanted to uh, go over a couple of figures. Many people have mentioned the reduction uh, in international students from India, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. And whilst we welcome, we, we agree that uh, the post-study work visa should be reintroduced, can I also put on the record there's been an increase from China, Nigeria, Malaysia, United States, Hong Kong, Singapore, Canada and several others. And that the total higher education enrolments are up 30,000 on what they were in 2010. It's still not good enough, but they have increased. Um, but as Liam MacArthur said, the number of first-year enrolments from non-EU countries to Scottish universities has actually increased, uh, although only by 1.5%. My main point was really from the College of Scotland paper, and it confirms that between 2010 and 2014, the percentage fall in EU students was 75%. Yep. European students, 81%, and international students, 23%. We don't want a fall in international students, EU or European, but I do think that, that when we're looking at post-work visa for non-EU students, we should also be asking the question, each and every one of us, why has there been such a drastic cut in EU and European students? The College of Scotland briefing paper states, traditionally Scotland uh, have been, uh, colleges have been able to recruit internationally. However, Priorities changed, I think Claire Baker mentioned the point, priorities have changed with the move to reform and regionalisation and colleges have to consider carefully what inter international activity, including recruiting overseas uh, students, is part of their delivery plan. Well, who decided on the college priorities? Who agreed on the college priorities? Which government brought through regionalisation? And why are international EU and European students no longer a priority? Let's have a little bit of honesty here. I think glass houses and stones slightly come to mind uh, at this point. But this initiative and responsibility is totally within the control of the Scottish Government as far as EU students are concerned. And I hope that the 75% fall, not the 23% international, the 75% fall in EU students will be addressed by the Minister in his summing up. Because I agree with Alistair, uh, Dr Allen that we want the brightest and the best. And I agree that the post-study uh, working visa should be introduced. But I also agree that we should be looking at further education and we should be looking at EU and European. As others have said, many of the skills shortages could be addressed by positively embracing EU, European and international students with skills such as IT specialists, technician, engineering and others. And it's particularly important, given that the NUS paper mentioned that Scotland, I think Claire Baker made this point as well, but Scotland has a higher level of skills shortages compared to other countries in the United Kingdom. In 2013, 25% of all vacancies in Scotland were due to skills shortages, compared to 22% in England, 20% in Wales and 18% in Northern Ireland. So it's for all these reasons and more that it's so important for the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government to continue dialogue and continue to come to an agreement on further devolution. The Smith Commission uh, cites additional issues for consideration to explore the possibility of introducing formal schemes to allow international higher education students graduating from Scottish further and higher education institutions to remain in Scotland and contribute to economic activity for a defined period of time. That is written in the Smith Commission and all it needs is goodwill, working and moving forward. This could be two years, which is the time mentioned by many, but it could also be uh, another period by agreement. 
But as Liz pa uh, the Smith also said, the Westminster Cross Party Group on Migration also supports much of what's been said today. And they, they went on to recommend, their report came out last month, Labour, Conservative and others, and they recommend non-EU students remaining in the UK for a period of at least 12 months following graduation, cross-party group. Improvements to Tier 2 to ensure that skilled graduates can be retained in key sectors of the economy, and we support that. Improving additional routes for post-study work in the UK in order to increase the access of UK employers to skilled non-European economic area graduates. And as the Conservative MP Richard Bacon said, and I quote, the government's current approach to post-study work and student migration is jeopardising Britain's position in the global race for talent. So we're actually all on the same page here. He also said we need to adjust our policy to improve our ability to attract students from around the world. Uh, they want to restore the UK reputation as the destination for choice for international students. So, presiding officer, it will be by dialogue, goodwill, yep. consensus, working together, putting our students first, putting our country first, putting our economy first, that will allow international higher education students to succeed to stay in our country and I hope the Scottish Government will do this and will work with the UK Government because it's to the benefit of us all. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Ian Gray, 10 minutes or thereby. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The, um, the focus of today's debate, uh, of course, has been the post-study work working group and their report to Scottish Ministers and many speakers have uh, examined uh, different elements of that report and different recommendations, different evidence uh, in significant detail. So it is worth, I think, towards the close of the debate, uh, going back to uh, the headline recommendations uh, from the report and noting them. The members uh, of this group were 100 per cent united in their support for the principle of a post-study work scheme which would enable non-European economic area students who complete study at Scottish further or higher education institutions to stay and to work in Scotland for a defined period of time after graduation. It, it, it is a, a diverse group. The membership of the group spanned uh, leaders from colleges, universities, students, uh, and indeed a variety of business interests. And all were unanimously agreed. And we should note, too, that this support uh, was based on wider consultation carried out uh, by the group uh, with the sectors that they represented. And that also yielded widespread support for the idea. In that consultation, 100% of education provider respondents were in favour of the idea, and 85% of business respondents, too, uh, supported post-study work visas. Interestingly, uh, that figure for business respondents uh, rose from 85 to 90 per cent amongst those who had already hired in the past an international graduate under previous post-study work schemes. Nan McTaggart was right to draw attention uh, to that finding because the scheme it shows that these schemes provide not just workers but world-class talent, not just qualified workers, but workers confident in their contribution uh, to the companies for which they work. So no wonder uh, this is a prospect that businesses find attractive, indeed essential, and no wonder that there is global competition for this talent. There's been uh, many references from speakers to the fact that this is not a new idea, <clears throat> and indeed that is one of the great strengths of the proposal. Between 2005 and 2008, Scotland benefited from the Fresh, fresh Talent Scheme introduced by then First Minister uh, Jack McConnell. During those years, 7,620 uh, non-EEA students benefited from visa extensions under the scheme. By definition, that is uh, 7,500 highly skilled and qualified people who have contributed to Scotland and to our economy. 
And indeed, as some have pointed out, so successful was the Fresh Talent Scheme, it was rolled up across the United Kingdom. Although unfortunately, of course, that led to its abolition in 2012. So when we consider reintroducing post-study work opportunities, uh, we know that they can work because they have worked before. And many speakers have paid tribute to Fresh Talent, but Labour believed that uh, our uh, motion should reflect that too, which is why uh, we refer to it in our addendum to the government motion. And of course, one aspect of this scheme having previously worked is that it shows that it can be achieved within a devolution settlement. And one of the refreshing aspects of today's debate, I think, is that it's been relatively free, almost completely free, uh, of constitutional uh, content. Uh, and the debate has been about what can be achieved uh, within the devolution settlement. We know from our own experience of the past it can be done. Speakers have also given us examples. Uh, Kenny McCaskill, for example, gave us the example of Australia. Curiously belligerently, but nonetheless, the point he was making was that in Australia, uh, it was entirely possible for South Australia to have its own uh, post-study visa scheme. And all of this, of course, is why uh, the Smith Commission, although that commission had little appetite for devolving immigration uh, as a whole, given the uh, decision of the Scottish electorate to remain part of the United Kingdom, in spite of that, round the Smith table, the idea of a post-study visa system was seen as desirable uh, by everyone. We shouldn't be surprised that post-study work schemes are supported by businesses because they are well aware that a number of sectors face recruitment shortages in exactly the kind of highly skilled professions likely to benefit from international students being given the opportunity to study and then live and work in Scotland. The report itself contains two telling examples uh, of exactly that. Chick Brodie uh, talked uh, about the example of software engineers in the games industry, but the report more broadly uh, tells us that in the digital technologies industry, uh, we will need something like 10,000 additional workers uh, every year. And the industry reports that current domestic supply is not enough. Even if measures were taken to address that domestically, that would take five or 10 years to make a difference. Uh, and in fact, these skill shortages, they tell us, are now seriously restricting growth uh, in a core industry. The report talks too about the oil and gas uh, sector. And of course, the North Sea has its problems. Uh, yet that sector continues to report difficulties in recruiting highly skilled personnel, over 70% of companies experiencing problems, looking for perhaps 12,000 new skilled recruits over the next five years, another demand which could be alleviated by a new post-study uh, visa work scheme. A number of speakers have correctly drawn attention to the point made in the NUS Scotland briefing that Scotland has higher levels of skill shortage uh, than the rest of the United Kingdom. And indeed, on top of this, uh, a demographic challenge with population growth projected at 9% by the middle of the century, rather less than the 16% forecast for England. And that having a particular impact on the proportion of working age people that we have as part of our population. All of that clearly adds up to the specific desirability of a post-study visa system here uh, in Scotland. But of course, it's not just our industries that compete globally, it is also our higher education institutions. Almost 30,000 international students studying in, one of our, univers in our universities. Uh, and although, as some have pointed out, the figure for non-EU students has increased significantly over five years, a little over the last year, there are indeed some worrying trends, particularly uh, around falls uh, from countries such as India, Nigeria and Pakistan. And in colleges too, we've seen a drop in non-European students uh, of around a quarter over a five-year period. I think uh, Mary Scanlon uh, has made a, a powerful point about the fact that we have to consider what's happened in colleges with regard to EU students as well. And the fact of the matter is you cannot cut the income to that sector, uh, reduce the number of students there by 140,000, and focus 
uh, their uh, responsibilities almost entirely on 16 to 19 year olds uh, without having an impact and I think that was demonstrated although it is a slightly different issue uh, by the figures contained uh, in our briefings. But international students contribute still tens of millions of pounds of income to colleges, hundreds of millions to universities, and more, of course, to the communities uh, in which they live. But uh, they bring as well a cultural diversity to our institutions, which is a key part of the educational quality uh, that they offer. And a number of speakers have talk, sp spoken of the importance of avoiding negative and prejudiced attitudes uh, to those who do come from abroad to study or work in Scotland. And I think it is worth noting and putting on the record the point that the international students we have all spoken of seeking do not in any way push out the opportunity for Scottish students in higher education because these places, of course, are above and beyond uh, fund places funded by the Scottish Government. I wanted to intervene. I thought the, the tenor of the debate has been very, very good. And um, I wondered, in the context of a general election coming up in six and a half weeks, uh, whether there's a Labour government in any way, shape or form, is the member confident that if there is a Labour government uh, in the UK that they would reintroduce the post study work visa uh, here in Scotland? I'd hope, I know we'll get his support, but does he think that that will happen? Well, the Shadow Minister for University Science and Skills, Liam Byrne, uh, who says... Um, uh, and he was responsible for the introduction of the original UK-wide post-study work visa scheme. He says he wants to see its reintroduction in some form. The conditions would not necessarily be the same, but he wants to see it uh, reintroduced. And in the same quote, he makes very clear that other point which our amendment refers to, uh, that we would like to see uh, students removed from any net migration targets. And to uh, Liam MacArthur, I say this is something we've called for for a while. There's only a few days left for the current government to respond to it. So I guess that this is indeed a statement of intent and something which a Labour government will do uh, after the election. Look, the, the presiding officer, the, the, the fact is that if the principle of post-study work visas commands such widespread support in the education world, the business world, and indeed in this parliament and the political world, it is surely, the reintroduction of post-study work visas is surely, in a particularly inappropriate figure of speech, a complete and utter no-brainer. It is something we should do as quickly as we can. Many thanks. Many, many thanks. Now call on Minister Humza Yousaf. You have until five o'clock, Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I think this has been uh, an excellent debate. And um, considering last week's debate, put forward uh, by the Greens and Independent Group on uh, the diversity of communities, which was also similarly consensual and positive. Uh, this debate being similarly consensual uh, and, and largely positive as well. Uh, we are in danger, of course, of being a parliament uh, on consensus. I can practically hear uh, the late and great David McCletchie, who often talked about the false god of consensus, <laughs> tutting down uh, at us uh, as we do this. But I think he would, be, I think he would uh, essentially approve uh, most certainly uh, on this matter. Uh, I will try to touch, uh, before I get into the substance uh, of my speech, maybe touch upon some of the contributions that were made uh, by members, maybe touching first upon Mary Scanlon's points uh, on, on colleges, and they were also made by uh, Claire Baker as well. I think she's, she's right to, to raise those concerns. College Scotland, of course, correct to raise those concerns too. I, I, I for one minute, don't view the post-study working uh, visa if it is reintroduced as a silver bullet. It's not going to resolve all the problems. There are some challenges there. There is a government, of course. We must work closely with our colleges uh, to, to, to address. I know there's no block on colleges working internationally, uh, even after uh, the, the process of reform that they've gone through. In fact, I've been out with colleges uh, before in India uh, and indeed uh, in, in China and seen the good work that they're capable of doing. But she's right to raise, and Colleges Scotland are absolutely right to raise that issue uh, of EU students, and I'm sure it's one that we'll reflect back on uh, take back, but I do think that the reintroduction of the post-study work visa will be a positive step in the right direction. And for colleges as well as universities, uh, Colleges Scotland was on the on, on a part of the, 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 the group uh, she would have seen. Uh, so they were well represented and of course agreed with the reintroduction of it. But that's not to, uh, as she says, absolve uh, sort of, uh, responsibility of other things that need uh, to be done. And there's an interesting um, discussion within the post-study working group report about uh, what level of qualification uh, the, 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 the post-study work visa should be at. Should it be at HNC? Should it be at HND? Uh, they make their recommendations as a government, of course. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking at that. Uh, yes, of course. 
Pension. Mr. Uh, Smith. I, I thank him for doing so. Um, within these discussions, is there also uh, some consideration to flexibility within the length of the visa? Because one of the very important points put across by some universities, uh, when it comes, particularly when it comes to knowledge exchange and research, is that it needs to be a slightly extended length, but not for other situations. I think it's a fair Mr. point to make. Uh, from my reading of the, the report, it says it should be a minimum of 12 months. So they don't suggest what the, the length should be. But having flexibility and variation, I think, is an eminently sensible I, uh, idea. There's also a discussion about whether or not that length of stay should contribute towards citizenship and indefinite leave to remain. And I think, again, I'm very open-minded uh, to, to that discussion. But I wanted to say that I thought the point uh, that was well and powerfully made by Mary Scanlon uh, was, was a good one. I thought the... I should say from the offset uh, as well that we'll be accepting, of course, the, the, the Labour amendment. I thought it was a very reasonable uh, amendment to put forward. And I'm, uh, I can speak, you can ask Lord McConnell, I'm never shy of giving him credit where credit's due and speak to him often on the Malawi question. I think he's right to give him and others uh, credit for the introduction of fresh talent. Though I would just caveat that by saying what is being talked about by the report uh, and the group here is not fresh talent mark two. Uh, the, the fresh talent is a new scheme uh, which we should rightly be proud of that of course as any new scheme does have teething problems or issues that it needed to, to fix uh, uh, and, and I think it would be wrong just to assume that this is fresh talent mark too but I, I think credit absolutely what it's due and completely agree too uh, with uh, taking student numbers out of the overall migration uh, numbers I think that's a, a, it's a failed policy it's not, not only is it non it doesn't make any sense uh, but also it's failed because uh, we know that uh, migration numbers uh, have risen, so they, it doesn't even fulfil uh, the criteria that the coalition government wanted it to do. In terms of the contribution of university students, international students, I should say, uh, I think the contributions from this chamber on that have been excellent. Many members reflecting on their own experiences. Uh, Christian Allard uh, telling us of his romance uh, too, which uh, I'm sure uh, all of us appreciated. Uh, students are more than just uh, important not just for financial and for the financial contribution as important as that is uh, much more holistic contribution that they bring uh, cultural uh, university experience and I think Mary Scanlon again correct to say that we also as Scottish as Scots take a lot from international students who come to make uh, Scotland their home and one one area that maybe uh, one effect of international students that wasn't touched upon is that they they raise the standards of our universities I know that from my own days in universities and uh, I have many uh, relatives who doctors, dentists, pharmacists, they all say that international students drove up the standards, worked harder uh, than those who were born here. And so they had to compete uh, to, to, to do that. So many, it raises the attainment of everybody uh, in that class uh, as well. Uh, and in terms of, uh, Mary Scanlon may, may used the phrase uh, that we're all on the same page uh, in terms of uh, the, the reintroduction of the post-study work, because I think she's right. Uh, hence our, our frustration uh, as a government. Uh, there has been a little bit of rolling back post the Smith Commission with discussions from officials, but I'm hoping that's just because uh, there's a general election coming up. Perhaps uh, ministers maybe are a bit hesitant to sign off on things. Minds are elsewhere distracted. Uh, so I'm hoping that that's just a, a temporary uh, malaise uh, indeed. In terms of the tone of the debate, I think it's been, it's been excellent. Uh, one point I would, I would raise and reiterate, as I did with Lee MacArthur, uh, is that perception uh, is often reality. I've travelled to a lot of countries in the world representing Scotland, also, of course, working closely with UK government ministers to promote uh, what the UK has to offer. Uh, but as positive noises as we can make, it's important. But they can often be undermined by uh, noises that come out from other parts uh, of the United Kingdom. And people do read in the papers and India, take India as an example uh, India is the most uh, newspaper read uh, country in the world the newspaper circulation is going up not going down and they will read international news uh, that comes and if the perception is uh, that, the UK, uh, that the UK is not open for business or for students uh, then that will become unfortunately the reality as well uh, I'm very sorry to disappoint Ian Gray uh, I know we didn't put devolution uh, in, in, in the substance of the motion and uh, uh, you know, that was purposely done so that we could get as much consensus uh, as possible. It's no surprise that we would like the devolution uh, of immigration policy. We've heard from Joan McAlpine, from Kenny McCaskill, from others, how there is regional uh, flexibility. But I think this can be done within the, within the parameters of Smith and the parameters uh, and the restrictions that we currently have. I would say that the fact that we could hopefully see the reintroduction of the post-study work visa, but it would be at the hostage of another UK government coming in in future years and taking that away, uh, is perhaps uh, uh, one of the flaws of the current devolutional, devolution setup that we have, of course. I will. 
Christian Allard. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Regarding the Smith Commission, I would like to know the views of the Minister. He'd been right on the back of the, of the, of the report of the, of the recommendation of the Smith Commission. Uh, don't we think that we could have hoped that uh, that uh, particular issue would have been resolved before this election, not knowing what kind of government we're going to get after 7th of May? Minister? Well, I, I think there's still time. There's six and a half weeks. And, uh, you know, uh, miracles can happen. Even governments uh, I've seen uh, might, might move quicker. So, I mean, I think this Parliament will send out a very, very strong message to say that as a Parliament we're united, all the political parties, I hope, will be united. Uh, in this call. So, you know, there is six and a half weeks to go, or maybe less, actually, until the Parliament actually dissolves. But I hope when there's a, a, a post-agenda election, whatever the makeup of the UK government is, whatever the makeup of the Westminster Parliament is, that actually uh, they will move on this issue extraordinarily quickly. I would also say that support for this uh, across the United Kingdom. Many members mentioned the all-parliamentary group and quoted from it. Uh, I read the report. I thought it was an excellent report. Uh, but again, they're saying the perception of the UK, uh, if, even if it's not the reality, but I think in some respects it is the reality, but even the perception is uh, that, that students are not welcome and that's having a, an effect not just in the Scottish educational sector, but of course uh, also on the UK uh, sector too. Uh, Scotland uh, cannot wait any longer for action. Our needs are different to the rest of the UK. And within Scotland, we have different needs. Uh, the, the needs of the, the north and the northeast uh, of Scotland, of course, are very different to the central belt. Uh, as well. So we hope that that change uh, will come quicker and we don't have to wait uh, till the general uh, election as well. Uh, Westminster approach, uh, I believe, is uh, damaging Scotland. Our latest migra migration figures show that net migration has actually decreased and fallen over the last year and we can't afford that. Uh, we can't afford that because of our economic uh, and our demographic uh, challenges. So that's why uh, I would like to, to, to stress the importance of rhetoric and tone and many members across this chamber uh, made that very point. I thought made that very point uh, eloquently too. I was this morning uh, at an event that was looking at Scotland-Pakistan relationships and there was an exhibition there uh, of many Pakistanis that had come here in the 1950s and 60s. I recognised a lot of the faces as many others would hear uh, the Bashir Mans uh, and Bashir Ahmeds uh, of this world were, were, on, were on these pictures. And Scotland was and the UK was of course a very welcoming place. It was the first destination that Pakistanis wanted to come to. Uh, you know, because of the opportunity, but because also, of course, the link uh, that they had uh, during the, the, the empire. Uh, but now, when, I, again, you go to these countries, the belief is and the perception is that the UK is not welcoming. I hope that we can change. Uh, yes, very, very briefly. John McAlpine. Uh. So, um, um, you'll have noticed in the brief from University Scotland that Pakistan in 2013-14 dropped out of the top 10 list of countries from which Scotland's universities recruit. Does they agree with me that that's very regrettable? Minister. Yes, I, I do. I think the point's been very well made uh, across this chamber that uh, the key emerging markets that we want Scotland to connect with, uh, India, uh, Pakistan, Nigeria, uh, and indeed China, where, we've, uh, you know, where, where we're not seeing uh, the numbers that we want to come through, that is, of course, very, very damaging uh, indeed. And these are countries that some countries we've had a very historical link with, Pakistan and India uh, being two of those, but also emerging markets, Nigeria uh, and, uh, as I mentioned, China as well. So, I, of course, I uh, agree with that. There's very few issues that I've seen the business sector, uh, including the, the IOD, the FSB, many others, uh, right the way through to the trade unions, all the way through to the academic sector, the colleges, Scotland, University of Scotland, very few issues. Uh, that I can remember that come to mind, but there's been such universal agreement uh, and across this chamber too. So I hope uh, that in that vein and very much in that spirit uh, that the UK government will listen. Um, whatever UK government, uh, whatever makeup of the UK government we have in six and a half weeks' time, that they too uh, act on this with, with, with the speed uh, that it deserves because our students, our, our academical institutions certainly need it. But I think Scotland needs it too. We benefit from migrants coming to Scotland, highly skilled migrants, highly intelligent migrants uh, coming to this country. Uh, and it's been championed by, by members here. The Smith Commission uh, left a chink of light open uh, in this regard. So I call on the UK government to continue to work with us, begin the preparations for the reintroduction of the post-study work visa in Scotland uh, and start those now because it will be in Scotland's interest it will be in the business community's interest. It will be in the academic institution's interest. Of course, I will be accepting uh, Labour's amendment to that. And I hope the Parliament can unite in sending a very strong message that international students are welcome to Scotland and always will be.
Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on post-work, post-study work visas. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 12780 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for the week. Any member who wants to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12780. Formally moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the motion to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12780 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. We now come to decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 12763.1 in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend motion number 12763 in the name of Hamza Yousaf on post-study work visas be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12763.1 in the name of Claire Baker is as follows. Yes, 93. No, 0. There were 12 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12763 in the name of Hamza Yusuf as amended on post-study work visas be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment, oh, sorry, the result of the vote on motion number 12763 in the name of Hamza Yusuf as amended is as follows. Yes, 93. No, 0. There were 12 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We're now moving to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.